Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the MilSurp World Podcast, the podcast all about military surplus. I'm your host, uh, Wish.com Grand Thumb, and uh, today we are joined by uh, Homo Sothias, 1000% hillbilly, and uh, Vetterly Lover. <laughs> you really are Wish.com Grand Thumb. Yeah, I love Homo Sothias, although I cut all the hair off so it doesn't make, like, it doesn't work anymore. Yeah, if, if you just need the hat, a hat, yeah, something like that. We'll have to find that. I think he picked his hat because it's rather unique. Yeah, I, I think. think he brought it up in the. Podcast. Or it was random, or it was like a random hat that he just happened to have. I, I think, think he maybe. just had it, is what he said. He, yeah, he had yeah. One of those hats, and he liked them. Well, he said too that he did it. So if he cuts his hair, so if he has to make a fix, you won't know. Which is that's right. real. That's real. It's that's like a long. It's like a long. Hard. Yeah, it's like a long hair problem. Cause uh, like you could you can notice that like the next day different hairstyle or whatever yeah. So my uh, wife is currently comparing you to Grand Thumb. Oh, on her phone. Yeah, and, if uh, she looks at, a, at the the later <laughs> Grand Thumb when he has I don't know if he still has a mustache, but he he yeah. grew a mustache too. It's like a, everybody grew a mm-hmm. mustache right like right around the same, you know, couple weeks there and uh, right around the time Top Gun came out I think, and uh, yeah, <laughs> Rooster. Gosh, man. So, so who do we actually have in the chat today, Danny? Oh, yeah, me, Danny. We have Aaron, Jared, and we have a uh, special guest, Cody, who, as I might have just tipped it off as a as the the veterly lover, <laughs> uh, who is uh, yep. one of our Discord members, and, uh, Patreon members. Yes, he is a Patreon contributor and a Discord member, because our uh, we have a Discord or we have a Patreon only Discord. Um, Patreon and Utreon uh, contributors get our get our Discord and then get to come on the show. Um, it's funny, Frantic. I, I mentioned you on the last podcast. I don't know if you listened to it, but I was like, we got to talk did. about these explodey I veterans. Did. I like that. Cause, yeah, I like that. Because you're the you're the Italian veterly guy, right? You like that's yeah. that's your thing. Cause we're gonna talk we're gonna talk about Italian stuff for sure. Uh, we're also gonna talk about pattern collecting a little bit more general, but. You have like that's your thing. That's what you collect most of, right? Or, uh, yeah, I got twelve of them right now. So, yeah, twelve and twelve and me. growing. I've only got eleven M ninety fives. Yeah, so that's the that's the yeah. that's the disease, man. <laughs> yeah, pattern. Yeah, right now, I've is... been right now. I've been buying a lot of the other stuff, bayonets, ammo, stuff like that. Cool. Uh, oh, instead of new rifles. I forgot. It's been a while since we had a, a, a new guest on. We have to ask you the questions, which is, uh, yeah. how did you get into military surplus, and what was your first military s- surplus rifle or pistol? I think I got into military surplus just by playing Call of Duty and Medal of Honor growing up. It's like your first um, first exposure to guns is World War II stuff. That's like what you think of when you think of guns. So, like, I always thought military surplus guns were cool. And of course the first one I got was a Mosin out of a crate from a pawn shop for 200 bucks. Yeah, that's like, it's, it's almost it's cliche at has. this point, yeah. Yeah, and, and that was that was like seven, eight years ago. Um, they were still like 200 bucks out of crates. Yeah, but for everyone our age. Yeah. yeah. Like, we're all, we all look roughly the same age. So we all had money at the same time. What's the cheap gun? Yeah, Mosins. Yeah. Chilean Mausers. Eighty-eight dollars, man. I paid eighty-eight dollars for Mosin. Fifteen years from now, people are going to be talking about how their first Milser was a Carcano they got for ninety-nine bucks. Mm-hmm. From RTI. So. The, my my only. Oh no, I bought a Type 53, I guess, but uh, the only M9130 I ever had was $120, and I got a whole spam can minus five shots because the guy had taken it out to the range, shot it five times, and was like, yeah, I don't like it. Yep. So, yeah. I bought that, a. That, that I, happened. <laughs> I bought an open spam cam just like that. Somebody just opened it, shot like a box or whatever out of one of the little packs out of it, and then, meh. Yeah, that's funny the way that works. So, uh, 
Rec recent acquisitions. I know our our time, real time. We've like this. These are like a week apart in this podcast and the last one. But uh, I have a gun show tomorrow. So if you ask me tomorrow, I could tell you, but not today. Yeah, that's that was exactly my predicament last week. Oh, you got two. I got two. Oh, he's got them ready too. Look at this. Yeah. Uh, Greek for the a oh. Greek 1903. Oh, I like it. The lighting's terrible, but um, I got this for 125 bucks. Holy! Yeah. So it's it's funny. The the stock is like handmade. It's a replacement. Somebody made this, I think, entirely by hand, and it's missing the uh, end cap here, and also the uh, ejector. But it 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 functions. Huh. I think it'll shoot just fine too. The bore's good on it. Yeah, he was telling me before the podcast started, he took it apart, and you can see inside the channel, It's it looks like it's been chiseled out. Yeah, it, it literally looks like somebody just used like a hammer and chisel and made it from scratch. But Or maybe I mean, a, it, a, maybe another stock that was like modified to work with Something it. like that, yeah. yeah. Um, and then the other thing I got was a Polish WZ-48. 22 long rifle oh yeah i think i saw you posted that earlier in discord yeah yeah the guy the guy wanted 425 for it uh i offered 350 he said no so i just walked away and then i came back 15 minutes later didn't even say anything and he he as i walked past he said give me 350 for it <laughs> <laughs> yeah the that strongest was... the strongest uh sometimes the strongest move is just walking away mm -hmm. yeah that yeah. that really works sometimes yeah it's kind of funny. Well, I was saying earlier, I saw a lot of pretty decent deals at the gun show today. Um, I think prices are starting to come down on a lot of things. Um, there was a FN 49 for 900 bucks, Romanian SKS for 500 bucks, um, Spanish Civil War Gewehr 98 for 700 bucks. There were some decent deals out there. Which FN 49? Egyptian? I don't know. It said eight millimeter FN forty nine. Yeah. Egyptian. It was Egyptian. Okay. It's still a good price for it. Yeah, it's still a good price. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, it's still a good price. It's a, it's the squeeze. They've got they've got money on their books. Yeah. You can tell have, people need the money. They don't have the they have the inventory, but they don't have the cash. And now they need the cash. So they need to figure out they can't just hang on to it forever. You know, so if they need it now, they're gonna they're gonna lower prices. Yeah, the show I went to today was kind of interesting like that. There was a lot of good deals, and uh, I was there for a couple hours from like 10 to noon or something, and uh, none of the good deals that I saw sold, which I was like, oh, that's going to sell soon. Like, that's going to sell soon, that that sort of thing. But, uh, I mean, there was a, there was a, a Moss 4956 that was in 762 for 650 bucks. Um, a Spanish M43 that was uh, 360 bucks. Uh, Spanish 1916 that was like 280, something like that. Uh, a Polytech M1A that was a, that was a grand. Um, right. Yeah, Eddie Stone 1917 was 750. Um, yeah, quite a few. It was it was a little sanded. The stock was sanded. Like the cartouches were pretty light on it. Um, but uh, yeah, like surprisingly good deals. Like there's quite a quite a bunch of those. I'm just like forgetting other other deals that I saw. But uh, yeah, I it's... know one of them things you saw. Oh yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah, you saw an M9524, which is a, a very uncommon variant of the M95, which is eight millimeter Mauser. Yeah, not to be confused with the M95M, because it's completely is... different. Because this yes. one has. Instead of an M stamped after M95, this one has a slash 24 after the yep. M95. So yep. just completely different. Don't ask me why. Nobody knows. Yeah. They don't um, know. About five grand, right? Or, or 5,000 yeah. of those are estimated. It's believed that they, the, the serials for the M95Ms continue. They don't start. There's never been a lower number than five. And they've never found a higher number than 5K for the M9524s. So it's assumed that that's when the switchover happened, but there's no proof of anything. Yeah, it makes more sense that it would be called an M95 
slash 24 because it's modified to be the like the Mauser M like 24 yeah uh, style it's, it's the VZ 24 uh it's, it has the same barrel same sights um same overall length um so like it's it's basically just aping an M95 action to be a, a VZ 24 yeah that's the wish.com M24 VZ 24 VZ24. I was like, what, M24? VZ24. Yeah. Um, that's the... It's yeah, 11 o'clock. That's, that's, CZ, <laughs> that's the CZ24 that you have at home. Yeah. That's that, yeah. They're, they're notoriously known for having broken extractors or missing the special clips that they had to put into them so they didn't have to be fed an M-block clip. So uh, they're they're they were not meant for long-term use. It was a stopgap measure. And they're notoriously known for have missing these things, and you can't use them otherwise. So they're basically just a lot of them are doorstops or wall hangers, checkbox. But, but Danny found one today, which the guy knew what it was. Unfortunately for Danny, so yeah. he did price it properly. It was the it was the guy with the with the two Spanish Mausers that I named off because you know like three hundred and sixty and two hundred and eighty, and the the you know the M ninety five twenty four wasn't marked. And I'm thinking, oh, like, is it in the same, you know, range? Is this going to be like three, four hundred dollars? I can swoop in and get this thing for. But no, the guy was like, it's eight hundred bucks. It's a, it's a, you know, need like described it to me. It's one of five thousand, blah blah blah. And I was like, oh, eight hundred bucks. Like, I'm not. He, he has Google. I yeah. mean, it, it, he's not wrong. I got mine for five, which is really good deal. Um, but it's it's kind of an odd market for those because um they're just a weird stopgap thing like they're not really if there's unless like you collect yugoslavian guns which some people do but like it's not really yugoslavian and then it's not really austro-hungarian it's not yeah. Hungarian. it's like it's a weird thing yeah, I think M95s kind of suffer from that in general because like collectors can't pin it down to one specific. Mm -hmm. Like it's like a regional gun. Yeah, and, it's uh, pretty much Balkans. Yeah, Balkan yeah. gun. And how many yeah. people do you know that just just collect Balkan guns? Like yeah, there's no one. Any yeah, I, mean, I I don't know anybody that just you know collects predominantly Balkan, you know Mausers which, or whatever. Which is funny because. There's so many guns that were used in the Balkans. A lot of them are scrub, though. Uh, well, a lot of them end up being modified and stuff like that. But like, those guns changed hands so many times. Bulgaria yeah. did not get along with anybody, yeah. and nobody got along with them. There's Balkan captured uh, K98Ks that you can find. I, I had a couple of those before. Um, yeah, I think mine is. Yeah, lots of interesting. And then you have like the the later production Mosins, right? They still produced Mosins into the fifties. Mm -hmm. Hungarians did. Oh yeah, Hungarians. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know if that's so much a Balkan thing, but because Hungary and Poland and mm -hmm. yeah, a few a few thought, countries did. Well, and then I mean, obviously Yugoslavia produced SKSs. Yeah. So imagine all, like. Imagine being Poland, and they're like, "We had these amazing Mausers that we made, high quality before the war." And then the the they get invaded, taken over by the Russians. They're like, "No, you make niet, you make mozin now." Yeah, and we had the sweet Viz thirty five. No, now you make Tokarev. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> you be Circle Eleven. You, now make, you make guns. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You must. Our ammo. You are welcome, comrade. So uh, I can go to my recent acquisitions if you guys. Oh, uh, Danny's got a start brag now. Here we go. So this is not a brag. This is just going through the list. I got a. I got another Peruvian fact. 1935. It's just a fact. Fact, Jack. Um, I got a Peruvian 1935. Another one. Because um, I found it on. It's. It's actually kind of. It's not like the best condition. Uh, but as a cleaning rod and a sling on it, um, but I got it for I got it for under five, which like we were just talking about that on the last podcast. Like you can't get a South American or whatever. I don't. It shouldn't have went below five, 
but it, probably the condition being a bit on the rough side, like the crest on the, on the receiver is not like the most crisp, but, um, I didn't think I would win it. And I was kind of like, oh crap. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll pay under, under five or whatever for it. So I got that. Um, and I got a, uh, oh, I got a sword. I don't collect a whole lot of swords, but I got this. This is a uh, an imperial. So if you're watching this on on YouTube, you can see the the sword. But this is a uh, an imperial landing forces sword, which is like the the Japanese Marines. Uh, I need to figure out a date, but approximately, probably this is uh, dated like 43 or 44, something like that. Um, I need to take the handle off to to see, but it's just like. Knock it so it has these two little like wooden you know dowel pin things that are holding it on and I can get one out but the other one is just it's stubborn and I don't want to hurt it so I've just been trying to gently get this thing out for for like days and it's not coming out so um, luckily would that be navy or army uh navy yeah navy navy which like the navy had an army so it's you know that's why I asked because it they were so bitter rivals and yes separate. yes they really the were army, the army had an aircraft carrier yeah it's, it's so weird like their their armed forces split is like they just happen to be named army and navy it doesn't really totally have to do with like what they what they're allowed to have like in u.s no, they just hated each other too it was all about oh yeah of, like to, to the detriment of their war effort they hated each other and would not support each other at some times but uh, so, so Japanese World War II swords, they all have some sort of like uh, retention method. So you can't draw, like you can't take the sword just straight out of the sheath. So this guy has a button that you can, uh, that you press. A little push button. And then, yeah, you can draw the sword out. And I found out this thing is sharp. So, uh, it's Would pretty... they sharpen those? Like a, is that, is that a thing? Yeah, it's not like a bayonet where they were kept dull. You know, these were, they actually did want these. You know, sharp. For See, I don't know about my, much about swords, so I didn't know if those were kept dull or if those were sharpened. Yeah, these were these were kept sharp. Yeah. Some swords are not. Some are. It depends. Mm. Yeah, like ceremonial dress swords or whatever. Right. Like, yeah, those not going to be, but like a like a combat sword, um, like this. Yeah, they you know they they were they were expecting to uh to you know to use these, and it does have it does have a mum, in case you were wondering. Yeah. Hey, so that's that. that's 90 percent of the value right there. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So it's my it's my second um, it's my second sword. I have a I have an NCO sword as well that I got a while back. But uh, and then this thing I've been looking for one of these guys for a while. A uh, a French MLE 1950 or a, a Mac. Mac or a, yeah Mac 50. It's the return they, of the Mac. Yeah, which is it's essentially a. Uh, Neither one of you respond. Neither, none of you guys. That was a great joke. I, I don't. I don't, I, I don't know if if people don't laugh. I don't know if it's a. Understand it. <laughs> the return of the Mac. All right, whatever. I'm sure somebody will comment. It's a song. I got it. I got your joke, Aaron. I understood. It. Somebody will comment that. I'm sure. Sure. I'm so sure. here we go. So we got two. Do we got two Macs? So we got the little Mac and we got the big Mac, <laughs> uh, and uh, so this is the this is the 1935 S. So I'll just hold right. it in my hand so you kind of get a size mm -hmm. reference for it, and then you have the 1950, which is uh, so the 1935 is you, and the 1950 is the guy she tells you not to worry about. Uh, check out this grip; That's it's cute. it's like yeah, like look at this. I can get like all. I get four fingers on this grip. Like you can have massive hands and have this gun, you know, easily. And that's just because the French, the French required a uh, nine round magazine. You know, it had it's single stack. So how do you get a single stack magazine to fit nine rounds? You make it longer, make it longer. <laughs> and then you got to make the grip longer. So, uh, the grip looks nice and fat too. Yeah. It's, it's pretty, yeah. it's, like, it's yeah. T H I C C. It's uh, it really, it really, really fills your hand up. I have to say the design, the the lines of it's very nice. Yeah, it's yeah, pretty. It it, nice. Yeah, it's pretty aesthetically pleasing. I would say. Um, 
very it's very modern looking if i had to if i had to say something about it yeah i mean it's it's browning derived you know it's essentially right. like a 1911 ish high power ish sort of sort of yeah. pistol i mean you can see you could definitely see the influence but yeah what's, yeah what's it in nine nine millimeter the oh. french finally went to nine millimeter with the 1950 yeah they, they had 32 french long with the 1935 and then they yeah i mean they could have went nine millimeter like decades previous i guess they sort of did with like the p38s and whatever they got but uh, yeah the hammer bite is confirmed with this i uh when i picked this up from joel's i put a we put a mag through it and uh yeah definitely definitely got my hand because i heard that forgot about it and just you know went to shoot it and uh and I was like, ow, 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 like, okay. And then I remembered sort of when it happened. But uh, yeah, been wanting one of these things and they don't pop up very often. And they're usually pretty that's, that's strange for you, Danny. You usually don't pick up stuff after 1945. I know, I know. There's like a few things post 1945 yeah, that I want. A lot of it, because it kind of ties in to previous designs like pre-1945 design. So then I stretch out a little bit like the Hakeem I want because it's like a Jungman. It's like a pre, you know, pre-1945 yeah. design. So I stretch, I stretch out a little bit for stuff like that. But yeah, anywho, that was the, that's my, that's my recent. Oh, I'm, I'm sure you wouldn't say no if you came across a cheap FN49 either. Oh yeah, no, no. I still want to, I have to have one of those. The yeah. one in seven, right? Venezuelan. Oh yeah, Venezuelan. Yeah, yeah Venezuelan. Venezuelan I would, yeah, I would love the, the most, but. There's, you see Egyptian ones. I've seen a lot of Egyptian ones, and uh, like I passed on one that was like eight fifty or something at a, at a show very really recently. I, tell you, I, I would love to find um, a Brazilian Vergaro. The Brazilian Vergaros in seven millimeter. If if we liked shooting the eight millimeter one, Danny, I guarantee you that seven one would be great. Hmm. Yeah, I bet so. Or just the original Portuguese in six five. Yeah, I've never shot one of those like that, so I don't know. But I, but I love seven. You know how much we love seven. So it is the best caliber. It is. It's God's own caliber. Mm -hmm. So, um, what, should we go? What grape juice are you drinking tonight, Danny? Oh, this is the uh, the finest generic purple drink on the market. Um. So we're going to go into, we want to go into Italian guns, Vetterlees, or do we t want to talk about pattern collecting first? Because we can kind of swing it either way. Let's, let's do the Italian guns first. Okay. Uh, we've talked about pattern collecting besides me before. Yeah. So okay. Frantic, we're going to kind of let you let you take it away here with, uh, with Vetterlees because uh, I know hardly nothing. Like I know the Swiss got it in 1869, right? And then the Italians yeah. got it like a year later. And uh, I've always been sort of flabbergasted. I know Othias talked about this in, 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 the, in the video. Like, why did the... The Swiss were like, cool, we want a nice 12-round magazine. We want an assaulty sort of gat here. And then, uh, and then Italy's like, no thanks. Just one, one bullet's fine. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's like that same attitude that you know, a lot of the other countries had at the time of just... They'll waste all their ammo. Too expensive. Because Italy, Italy was only like fully unified like in 1870. They had been working on the unification for like decades before that. They were poor. They did not have the money to do the nice Swiss Vetterlies. So I think that's one of the big reasons that they wound up taking the uh, single shot pattern of it. But yeah, they adopted the Swiss Vetterly as a single shot rifle in 1870. And then they use that through 87, and then that became the 7087, the Vitali uh, conversion. And they started using smokeless powder in the 10.4s in 1890. Uh, they adopted the 1890 uh, ballastite round. Um, and then in 1915, they started converting uh, about 400,000 of them to 6.5 Carcano and relined the barrels. And uh, those are fun guns. They're fun yeah. guns they to shoot. They blow up. Um, they all blow up. They, yeah, up. they, they, up. they, all, they all blow up. Explodey boys. You even if you if you put like one of these anywhere near it, it just blows up. Sends sends you link to a CN Arsenal explodey, Vetterly video. Yeah, 
I, I've gotten in the habit of now, some, I, I get entertainment out of it. When I post a picture of one of them, I, I make the title just something really, I make it look like I just, some guy that has just one of them. Uh, because somebody will always immediately link me to the CN Arsenal video and tell me not to shoot it. I've had people say like, you're gambling with your life. Um, you you know, you're going to die. That's going to explode. And it's, uh, it's oh, yeah. Funny. Yeah. I get a kick out of it. Yeah, you got to, you got to get those guys now. Um, Always gambling with milserps. I don't understand what everybody's like. Oh, you're gambling. Everybody's gambling. <laughs> you don't know what's what that rifle's been through before yeah. you got it. Yeah, yeah. You you technically don't know if that one bullet that you're putting in the gun had all the powder taken out and replaced with C4. You don't know. <laughs> Could have been a, a sabotage round, like the like the like the Walking Dead. That one episode. I don't all, I don't get all the guns, attack. all the guns blew up in this one episode. Uh, Guy sabotaged. I feel him. like it's been. I feel like it's been forever since that show came out. Yeah, that's a that was a poor reference there on my part. Um, no, it's just that we don't watch crap TV. I feel that way every time I hand someone the Snyder because it's black powder reloads in a cartridge case, and if you like, you're not supposed to have air gaps. So I load it and I give it to him. I'm like, please don't explode. Please don't explode. Please don't explode. <laughs> it goes off and I'm like, hey, you're still alive. Yeah. The Snyders are cool. I'd love to have a Snyder at some point. It's a lot more fun than it looks and it looks fun. Trust me. <laughs> I'd go for a, wor- a Verndel. Those are, those yeah, are those cool. are cool. I want one. So Frantic, want one. How, much, how much money do you think the Italians actually saved omitting the magazine from the Vetterly? At the beginning, I have well, I have no idea, but um, I mean, it's probably significant enough, um, right? If they're going to make a couple million million of them, this is this yeah. is a this is a logistics issue, and this comes up a lot where I work, which is, well, they could just drill an extra bolt hole here, and it would work better. That's true, but that hole costs money. So if it was a dollar, and they made two million rifles. They saved two million dollars. That's a lot of money, right? Yeah. So yeah. you have to look at it logistically that way. Like, okay, yeah, yeah they have five bucks a gun. Yeah, scale. scale. Yeah. Yeah. So, but then they had to go back later and add a magazine a, to it. That's a problem for future Italy. All right, yeah, current Italy's future. broke. Future Italy can figure that out. All right. Yeah. Look how much money I saved all you people. Don't you well, and then vote me in again. It isn't just what he's talking about either. You don't have to produce as many rounds because you don't need to have 12 shots in every rifle and extra ammo on top of that. You only need to have the standard amount for a single shot rifle, whatever they ended up that, converting that to be. But So it does make more sense logistically in scale too with ammunition production which i'm assuming they don't have much of at the time period yeah yeah i mean you're saying like that's a big deal italian unification was 1870 you said i think that was like the like the end date more or less i'm not i'm not 100 percent up with that history but i know they've been it, it was a process that spanned like decades um but i think it was around 1870 was when it was completed that's when like the First, the glittery marched into Rome or something. That's what a lot of people don't remember or don't realize, especially in, in American uh, history, is that Italy was like 50 different principalities, countries, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It was just a bunch of different states. Yeah. They, they, they all didn't like each other. They all, they all still kind of don't really. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Because people, like, uh, United States is kind of a young nation, right? We know we haven't been, oh, like, only the 1700s, but Europe's been there forever. But, like, actually, the United States is, like, quite a bit older than a lot of European countries. Like, we're older than Germany, we're older than Italy, because those didn't exist, you know, unified But when the United States, um, you know, became a country. So, I actually heard a, a great thing on that, which is, in America, we think 200 years is a long time, but in Britain... 200 miles is a long way. Hmm. 
Yeah, Britain. Yeah, that's one of those countries that's like it's, the exception. It was a British thing. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Forget about Germany too. We have the eighteen seventy one. No, what's the stupid? The Holy Roman Empire. That's right. HRE. Oh yeah, that yeah. was that was the uh, was that the first Reich or was that the second Reich? The the, the Holy empire, Roman empire that was, that wasn't holy, it wasn't Roman, and it wasn't an empire. <laughs> yeah, that's some pretty interesting history. The first Reich, and I'm gonna get told I'm wrong. The first Reich, I think, was Barbarossa. So Barbarossa had the Reich. I think it was in the 1400s. Again, people with the internet are gonna be like, "You're wrong, idiot." I'm you gotta be wrong. You gotta be wrong about something. I'm be wrong about something. I'm be wrong about this. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Barbar that Barbarossa was the first strike, and it was in like the 1400s. I, think, I don't know why 1452 sticks in my head, but it's probably wrong. No, it was the <clears throat> Holy Roman Empire. Yeah, Holy was Roman it? Empire. Was, according to according to what Hitler yeah, defined uh, the Reich as, uh, let, let's just put it that way. So that's why he said his was the third. So you have the Holy Roman Empire as the first, and the second was the Imperial German Empire from 1871 to 1918. So his was going to be the third empire for Germany. That's not like a great track record. I probably wouldn't even count that second one. That's just like 40 years. That's like a low expectation that like... I mean... It's like 400 years, 40 really years, 13 years. Any. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> Spoilers, man. I haven't I haven't watched uh watched uh, you know, crap, what's that show that just came a, out? It was a great Norm Macdonald joke. It was like, the more I hear about this Hitler guy, the more I just don't like him. Yeah, no, he would say uh I know what you're talking about. He would he would he would say it to, you know, you talk about him. You know that uh, the more I hear about this Hitler guy, the more I think he's just a just a real jerk. I love I love Norm, man. Yeah, R.I.P. in peace. I'm sorry, I can't. R.I.P. in peace. I can't not I can't not j laugh when people say that nowadays. Yeah. So. Uh, so anyway, so back to Vetterly. So frantic. I know. I know this is like uh, hindsight, twenty twenty. There was reasons, but do you think it would have been cheaper for them originally to have gone with the Swiss Tube magazine versus retrofitting them all to that later magazine design? Maybe, but I will say the. I think the the Vitali magazine is is going to be superior to the Swiss Tube. Because you know the packet, yeah. you got twelve rounds. If you got to reload one at a time through twelve of them, that's pretty slow. The the charger clips for the uh, for the Vetterly, these, these work really well. Um, you wouldn't think because it's just a piece of wood with a little tin strips hmm. on it. These are really fast. You that, you can you can just in and out. Is that repop? Yeah, these are these are made by uh, AV Ballistics out of Australia. Cool. And I've I tried making my own from hand. This That's one actually neat. works. It's just it's just hideous. That's but, neat. Um, you have a three D printer. Oh, yeah. no, no, it's just, not the three D no, printer, just, for Danny. No, it's just <laughs> made it by hand. It. It yeah. shows it again. No. It's just it's, it's cut out by I know. Ten snips. I know. I'm asking it's if you have one because you could you could work on one. I've thought about 3D printing them, but you know, trying to get the 3D printing for you know, like that thickness of of oh yeah, tin. yeah, that might be this impossible. has to have this has to bend a little bit, so I'm not sure. But um, Plus the, yeah, I would I would say that um, in the in the big picture, the the Vitali magazine is probably better choice than a tube magazine because it you, you really can reload it quicker. And it doesn't have to have that lifter in it, too. Yeah. Because the lifter's a bitch. Yeah. I mean, it's... I mean, we, we, it's we've already seen the disadvantages of a tube magazine with the French, too, in history. So, I mean, it's... it's. Uh, I would say it was, like, weirdly beneficial to Austria... Or Austria. Well, I'm stuck on Austria. 
weirdly beneficial to Italy to not have the money for the tube magazine because they didn't get stuck with a technology that was quickly outdated and surpassed. Yeah. And then well, we were definitely. able to, to update to a, a modernish magazine, essentially. It was four shots, right? Yeah, four. You can And you can do four, uh, close the... Um, Bolt. magazine cut off and then single load. Oh, it had, a, it had a cut off too? Yeah. So what they did is they took the, the single shot has a dust cover that rotates and, and covers the ejection port. Um, and when they, they added the Vitali magazine, they cut off like the front part of that uh, dust cover and they retained the back part of it to act as a uh, magazine cut off. So if you take apart a, uh, a single shot one, the, the dust cover will slide off the front if you take the front sight off or the rear sight off. Um, and it it's, it's goes all the way around the receiver um, and they just started cutting that back. Um, and then when they did the 6.5 Carcano conversions, they cut it back even more. And the only thing it does is it holds the little, um, little, it's called the quo in, I think is the right term for it. The little piece that holds the bolt in place. Hmm. That's interesting. You know, you said, uh, you said Aaron that the tube magazine was kind of quickly, uh, quickly outdone, but for the French it was, but I just kind of did the math and I think tube magazines kind of was relevant for about 20 years because it was in the, the Vetterly in 1866 and then up into the Labelle in 1886. So it's not, uh, well, not, not 66, 69, 67, 67. I wanna. Okay. I, there's, there's like, there's like one photo. The original Vetterly was hammer fired. Mm -hmm. Look up 1867 Vetterly. It's really cool looking. Yep. It's got a real funky bolt, uh, different from the one that you're used to seeing, and it's got a big hammer on the back. It's really cool. Yeah, Vetterlys are neat. Like mechanically, I think they're super interesting. Um, I've always really liked the Swiss. I have, I have one Swiss Vetterly that's like right, right over there. Um, it's 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 got you know the the lifter for the for the tube magazine which I just thought was you know working the bolt on it and seeing this lifter thing work I thought was really neat just sort of playing with it um, so there the action is kind of interesting and and I know kind of uh, Othias says this is that it's almost I, I'm trying not to use any cliches like groundbreaking but it had front locking lugs correct rear rear yeah but some wait symmetrical sleeve. what was the yeah symmetrical symmetrical mm -hmm. locking lugs that was the, that's the dealio with the vetterly yeah and i mean compared to, rear, to black powder yeah part of it yeah being at the rear kept the uh, lugs away from black powder fouling but um, you know compare that to the other early 1870s single shot rifles the mauser 71 the gra they all just had the bolt handle locking against the receiver yeah yeah right? just a single so so the the original design is actually really really good probably have... go ahead one of the best i have this weird veterly that i bought off of danny it's a it looks like a cut down but it's it's like miniaturized and i think it's police but it's in, mm -hmm, yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah, it's just shorter. It looks like an 1871. It's smaller. And it has the uh, the cover for the feed. I can't think of the name. Yeah, yeah. You don't see those a lot with the little cover for the uh, uh -huh. loading, loading port. Loading port. Thank you. Loading, loading, loading gate. gate. Yeah, loading and gate. There. Yeah. yeah. There's just a hole. Um, but it actually has the cover for that. And I, I, you know, I Googled it and I don't know what it is. And it's in my safe. <laughs> it's a little hunt showdown. Version. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's police. It said it was police. I don't know. Or most likely is police, but it's, it's yeah. neat. It's, it's, it's definitely not like a Bubba cut down or whatever. Mm -hmm. like it's, it's, it's nice. And, it was made uh, that way. Yeah, but it's it's a odd pattern. I couldn't find it in any, any like like Vetterly books or Swiss like rifle books. I couldn't find that exact pattern. And I asked some people, and like they had various opinions. But yeah, it's kind of one of those interesting ones. It does make sense that it would be like a a small police contractor or something. 
Yeah, I don't know. That, that I'm not claiming I know what it is. That's what Google said when I looked when I, before I bought it because I didn't know what it was, and I kind of figured out if I can't figure it out, it might be uncommon. Rolling the dice. Swiss ones yeah. are still cheap. You can still get those for a good price too, which is nice because they're they're neat rifles. Yeah, and yeah. I, I, Cody, I know I know you're like the Italian Vetterly guy, but I just I'm gonna keep talking about Swiss Vetterlies because that's just kind of no, what I, I know. I'm gonna get at some point. I'm gonna buy one. I, I need to have like an 1869 version because I think that would be appropriate to have since it's what the Italians nice. would have adopted. Yeah, yeah, you, you, yeah. You got to nice. get one of those. Um, but they're so they're so neat. I did this video talking about the Swiss, the Swiss Vetterly and uh, sort of throwing out the idea that it was kind of a quasi assault rifle, sort of, for the day. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. yeah. You had so many different opinions on that video. Oof. Yeah, yeah. With the original, I forgot what the original title was, but I was trying to be a little more clickbaity with the title, and I got a lot of mean comments. With that one, it's like, like first. you're an idiot to think that the Vetterly's an assault rifle or whatever. So I was like, ah, let me change this to assault rifle question mark or something like that. Because I was like, well, what you know, what meets the definition of it? I thought this was Vetterly cartridge was like pretty um, intermediate ish into because it's not it's not like you know 43 Spanish or 43 miles or whatever. You know what I mean? Like it's kind of uh, lighter recoiling, lighter muzzle energy. Um, so it kind of felt like, and it's shorter too, like overall it's, it's, it's shorter. So it felt intermediate ish to me. And then 12 rounds in a magazine, like the most of any gun. And it was one of the first, I think the first bolt action. I think it might've been action repeater. bolt action repeater. Yeah. Something like that. I mean, you would have had bolt actions before, right? Like technically, like yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, needle guns are bolt action. Yeah, bolt so, action. Yeah, I think repeater. it. I think it was the first bolt action repeater. So to me, it seemed like it might sort of fit that definition. But I know that's like a modern, weird definition to throw on such an old gun. But it's kind of it's sort of my thoughts with it. The Italians. How does the cartridge like compare to like the seventy-one Mauser? So the original load for the uh, Italian one was uh, about a 300 and I think 13 grain bullet over 62 grains of horse black powder is what it seen it as. I mean, it's a it's like a decent cartridge, you know. It's um, it's probably about on par, maybe a little bit weaker compared Say to some of the other. It uh, sounds a little smaller. Cartridges. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's, it's 10.4 by 47. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so... But I wouldn't want to get shot with it, so it's fine, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so a little smaller, but... I mean, who cares, can you, right? Can you see it going down range? No. <laughs> <laughs> In the right light, you can see 45 ACP. Yeah, that was my first thoughts. 45. Mm -hmm. What's interesting, though, is the... Uh, the uh, smokeless powder version of the 10.4 round that they adopted in 1890, that was uh, like a 240 grain bullet, and they got that velocity up to like 2,000 feet per second with it. Wow. And, and um, they, they, there was, um, there's a picture in the, the Italian Vetterly book of a, uh, there's like a diagram of like the wound cavity testing for that. Uh, apparently, those rounds were, they would mess you up pretty bad. That's so. a pretty heavy bullet. Yeah, for it to be going yeah. that fast. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's, I'm surprised the Vetterly can handle that, honestly. That seems like a, a lot of pressure. Yeah, so that so that's when you get into the, the whole thing about, like, what can the what can it handle? You know, because w when people talk about the 6.5 ones, they say, you know, it can't handle it. It can't handle it. It's, you know, the original rifle, every gun's designed um, in its original configuration with the original ammo it was designed for, it, it's designed to run basically forever. Like, it'll outlast whoever's shooting it, right? That's generally how militaries made guns, and they, they tested them, right? Um, you take a gun, and then you modify it once, and you mill out a bunch of uh, material in the receiver to add a magazine. Um, 
And then a couple years later, you upgrade the, uh, the uh, cartridge to have smokeless powder, increase your pressure even more. Um, and then like 30 years later, you mill out even more uh, material from the receiver because they needed to uh, extend it even more for 6.5 Carcano, and then you rechamber it again. So you've got two separate times you're taking material out of it and two separate times you're increasing the pressure. Like, any gun that you do that to is not going to last forever. And I think that's that's basically my opinion on them. Um, is that by the time you get to the 6.5 Carcano one, there's like a finite lifespan on them. They're, they're not going to last forever. The thing is, you just don't know, like, nobody knows... They, they must have tested them, right? Like, they, they didn't just come up with a conversion to 6.5 and go, oh, let's make 400,000 of them. They must have tested it first to see, like, is this worth doing, right? Um, and Especially, it must have been... See, that's what... I didn't realize it was 400,000. Yeah. That, that to me, is like, oh, we did test this. This, this was absolutely, like, a good idea. Because cause I know from my, my experience from World War One of of m95s the austrians tried to to see if they could convert uh, captured m91s to 8 by 50 r and they said it, they thought they realized it was too much of a hassle so they just said fuck it and they just shot uh 8 by 5, uh, 8, uh, 8 by 56r out of the m95s and vice versa they just didn't bother with it but they did try but it was deemed too expensive and not much of it of worth it. But if they're doing 400,000 units, it was tested and approved. Yeah, and it, and if you think about it too, like they, they still had 10.4 ammo because they still issued those too. There's pictures of Italian soldiers in World War One with the eight, uh, 1870-87s in 10.4. So they still had ammo, which means when they converted them to 6.5 Carcano and tested them, they must have held up enough um, to exceed the amount of cartridges they had uh, of 10.4. Like, if they tested it and found, like, oh, this thing will make it for, like, 50 rounds, then there would be no reason to do that if they had enough ammo on hand to give each guy 100 rounds of 10.4. It would have been a waste of time. So they must have tested it and found out that it was worth doing. The problem is, like, nobody knows what that number is. It could be, like, 500. It could be 2,000 rounds. Um, you know you're not going to kill your own guys, too. That's the thing. That, it's yeah, the same yeah, yeah, with the, exactly. the last-ditch Jap guns, right? Like, you're not going to kill your own guys. <laughs> like, I like got so yeah. many dudes. Like, I don't. I never yeah, understood the thing that. With that. The thing with that is like, yeah, you're you're not going to give something that's like that dangerous and issue that out. So, um, you, you just you don't know what the the lifespan of it was based on their testing, and then you don't know how much it's been shot by the time you get it now. I mean, they're like 130, 140, up to 150 years old, right? You, you got no idea. Um, so you might have one that's like not been shot at all, and it's like in perfect condition. Um, and you might have one that, that got beat to crap in World War One and then sent to Ethiopia uh, in, the, in the colonies and got shot even more. And now you get it. And it's like in really bad shape, and yeah, that one can you can have failure risk there. So something else on those. Did you ever slug the bore on one of them? No, I, I, I haven't. The reason I bring that up is because it's something I learned a long time ago from a guy who doesn't do YouTube anymore. It was Gunnut 357 Mag, and he was cool. I liked him. He taught me a lot about reloading, and. He had a problem, and I'm remembering from then, so hear me out. He had a problem with one of his Carcanos, and he slugged the bore, and the bore was smaller. So, how, how small? Because uh, normally Carcano is like 267, 268. Something. And it was undersized, it was like 262. Ooh. That's a lot. Yeah, 5,000 a lot. lot on a smokeless gun. 5,000 a lot. So, like, that was the problem, and it was, the rifle was supposed to be set up for, I don't remember exactly what it was, it doesn't matter. The point being is, if they had a difference of 5,000 a barrel, that's a problem. 
yeah, definitely. It was something I always wondered was, well, what's the bore slug at? You know, just because if you're going to, if, if, and if there is a variance and you're going to hand load for something like that and you, you think it's going to be a problem, what's your barrel at? Because if you're going to, if you're going to put the, if you, if you think it's going to explode, you should know all the things before you do it, right? Yeah. No, I, I do need to slug some of mine, but I, I just haven't gotten to do that I was yet. curious, a, you know. Is that a rebar or is it a sleeve? They're a sleeve. sleeve. It's a sleeve, and everybody that everybody that doesn't know much about them will say that they um they soldered they soldered them in there, and if you shoot it and it gets hot, the solder will melt and it'll fall out, and it's just none of that's true. Um, For everyone on the East Coast, that's solder. And it's like even it's even they even talked about it in the C and Arsenal video, so like. <laughs> People didn't pay attention to that part. They 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 um, bored out the original barrel uh, with steps in it, mm -hmm. uh, and then they stuck in a liner. Um, and then what they do is they push steel rods through that, um, and that stretches it out from the inside out and it press fits it into the barrel. Um, and then they re rifle that, that, and that's how you get to six five. I think and they did that it... to they did that to Vickers guns too. That was an approved technique for for uh, Vickers machine guns. So when people say, "Oh, you, you, those are so dangerous because they're lined," it's like, no, it's that that liner has nothing to do with it. If you can do that to a Vickers machine gun, it's fine. I think the, they did some broom handles too. You have uh, issues with the uh, Chilean AK 95s with that, which was a terrible conversion, which has been proven. Uh, but that's also a. a uh, really stupidly done conversion and who did it? I think I was list I was reading something about that or listening to something because it's not the same way. What was? How did they do that? So they over they overboard they reamed out the chamber, and they didn't they didn't put a new barrel and they just reamed out the chamber, and put a sleeve in the chamber and actually that is soldered in. Um, oh okay it, and, and and so. <clears throat> There's a there's a gentleman that we have in our Mauser group on Facebook who has his own site, and he had a barreled action of one of these. Uh, this is a Chilean 1895 rifle that's been converted to 7.62 by 51 NATO, um, and he uh, had a water jet cutter and he cut it in half, and you can see on his site you can see the picture of uh, the sleeve, and um, the solder is missing around it. It's essentially right where the end of the cartridge would be. So it, the, the, the ignition would be, would be pushing on that solder every time you fire. And, um, there's the chance of the sleeve just popping out essentially. Um, so it's, it's not a good conversion and that's not the same thing though. So, uh, it's probably getting lumped in together. With people yep. that don't yeah. understand, yeah. Well, I've two. never heard of any of them exploding, but um, I know that some people have noted on like gun boards and stuff, like, "What's this weird marks on my brass?" Because the 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 joint is increasing in gap, so it's marking up the brass, and so they're like, "What's going on?" And then when, when that started happening, the guy that I'm talking about, he that's when he decided he had this barreled action, let's just cut it open and see what happens. And that's when they discovered this was really stupidly done. Well, that's the difference between a repair done in the teens and the repair done in the 50s. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Cody, when when the Italians issued these Vetterlies in 6.5, I'm, I'm assuming they just issued it with standard issue pressure 6.5, right? They didn't issue yeah, as, it with lighter loads. No, no, I don't think so. Because that just seems like uh, it'd be a whole it logistics. Hot machine gun ammo, Danny. But yeah, they, 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 you know, they were like rear line stuff. I mean, they still got used. They just they weren't sticking them on the very front lines. Uh, sticking them as everyone that's as far back um, that can take that and put the Carcanos to the front line. That's what they did. Because it seems like it, it seems almost like we have contradictory information. Because 400,000 of them done. So obviously it was a well thought out, tested thing and, and good enough, right? And like Jared says, you're not going to issue something that would explode the first time your troop shot it. 
issued with full powered loads. And now fast forward to today, if you people just say like, it's gonna blow up instantly the first time, and you do have, uh, you know, Othias's video showing, they're showing two of them um, exploding. But, um, oh yeah, we should get into what, why, Cody, why do, you, why do you think maybe that Othias, and I, I know this is just sort of speculation, we don't actually know, we should maybe talk to, talk to CN Arsenal or whoever does their reloading maybe, but I wanna know your opinion on that, Cody. So on the on the C and Arsenal video, and there's yeah yeah. So you you, you yeah, can so, you can so vent a little to, bit. You can vent a little bit to all the people I'm that gonna, I'm not gonna that, I'm not gonna vent too much in case Othias watches this and thinks I'm dissing him. No, I mean more I for do, the I do love C and Arsenal. More but, for the um, people that post it, send it to you every yeah. single time. Yeah. So you know I don't know. They they did have they had two rifles fail, um, and one of them one of them was cracks in the locking lugs. Kind of mm -hmm. like this. Um, actually, here's some cracked locking lugs. Um, you can see oh, right yeah. there next to that. Yep. And then there's a second one right here. Got this on one of my rifles. Actually, a 10.4 millimeter one. Not sure what was up with this one. Um, but they had one of them crack lugs, and I don't remember what happened to the second one. I don't know they if exploded. that was like a full... Did the second one... Oh yeah, yeah. The second one vented gas down into the stock and yep, blew, it out. blew the stock out the sides. Um, so, the thing with that is, like, I, I really don't know the loads they were using um, for that. Uh, they they said the first one was eighty five percent, the second one was seventy percent. I don't know what bullet they were using. If they were using a two six eight or two six four, um, yeah. I've, I've heard somebody say that they used two six eights, but I, you know, I. That's, that, so I don't that's really why know. I asked about slugging a barrel too. Yeah, because if they were using two six eights and it was like a two six two bore, then it's like I've never I, I, I don't know. I've never heard about a the, the two six two thing is interesting, but I don't think I've ever seen This is my I, memory seen from a long time ago. There's been a lot of slayed soldiers laying here on the I'll counter. Have to go, I'll, all right? have to go, I'll have to go look at it. That, that that's, sounds interesting. That guy used to post things. He was cool as shit. And he doesn't anymore, and he deleted all his videos, but he taught me how to reload a bunch of stuff, and I wrote a bunch of stuff down. But there was, he had a special stamp on his gun, and it was like two crossed rifles. It wasn't like a like a Mosin thing. It was two crossed rifles and something else in the stamp, and it meant... Yeah, that's a little accuracy. accuracy. Yes, that. That's and the accuracy that, mark. That rifle had a smaller bore. Okay, the, the the accuracy mark thing also drives me nuts because everybody sees that and they go, oh, that's a sniper's rifle. That was for the best marksman in the squad. It's like, no. They they took random rifles out of the production line. They tested them, and if they passed, they got the stamp. That was it. That's it. Yeah. But he, like, everybody nowadays is like, oh, this is, a, this is like a marksman's rifle. This was a, more accurate than all the others. Yeah. The FUD Lord. It's a random Why spot did check. It's yeah, it's a random, random spot check. It's literally yeah. just a random spot check. I was just going to ask what the point today. of it is. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. just a spot check. We do but, the, we do those uh, in our manufacturing at, like, at our facility. Just like yeah. the most odd version of uh, like QC ever. <laughs> no, you just you you I mean, do I'm it. I'm pretty sure everyone did that. I don't yeah, think it's that was a just manufacturing. Italian. It's a manufacturing thing. You, but it's like you, marked. Like this one's yeah. fine. No, 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 no. What it what it's saying is is that. What it's saying is, okay, is the the serial number from that one to the one before it is the same. They're, they're both good. So yeah. anything in that line is good. So what happens is if you get one that's bad, then you have to go back and go, okay, the serials from this previously to this one, what do we need? To, we need to go back and look. So that's a, okay. that's a way of checking it and way of stopping it from being where you run – thousands and thousands of thousands of guns versus running like a couple hundred maybe like only a hundred i don't know what their checkpoints All right. were yeah yeah i'm smelling but, what you're so stepping that's how, in that's, yeah that's how they mm -hmm. that's how they limit the amount of mistakes yeah so again the guy who knew what he was doing like he at least he appeared to know what he was doing because i use a lot of his methods to understand how to do what i do um his rifle was smaller. I have to dig into that because that's that's really interesting. I feel like, Cody, it could be a rabbit hole. 
Yeah, you should. Yeah. I think you should. You should bore all of your six fives and see, and then you need to go back to RTI and just start start doing start it. Just go, yeah. Slugging, just slugging barrels at RTI. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A, a bucket of wet I, I just wet get air. get a huge like amount of data on the on these bores because I feel like if you if you really did that and and they let you like slug them, you know, and you had like a list of like a hundred. And like, you know, you could really see how it varies or whatever. Um, I feel like that's a really good, you know, data point for for what it would actually be. That'd be fun. That'd be a lot of work. Yeah, you know, okay. Um, I, don't think I, I don't think I felt more physical pain than uh, the end of the time when I was at RTI. Um, when I left after um, the, I think I, I messed with like 100 something, 100 something federalies. They were up. I I had to go on a ladder one at a time, reach up, pull them off the pallet, bring it back down, record all the serial numbers, put it in a stack. And, and I did that for hours. And then I had to go put them all back. And by the time I got done with that, I was like broken. That's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was going to ask, like, just for people out there who maybe don't know or whatever, like, what was your, tell us your RTI story and how they just sort of. How how you came to be able to do that and because kind of what you Cody, think of that? Cody actually went to RTI, which is not yeah so yeah. So I I started recording serial numbers and, and keeping a database of the the federally. I kept like the um, the date, the serial number, the pattern, the manufacturer, um, and then any sort of oddball information on on them. Um, and I just shot Uli an email and said, "Hi, I'm doing this. Can I come to RTI?" And look at your veterans and he said yes and i went and did it i mean it was yeah that's that was pretty much it I, I that's really cool that he let you do that he's, he's really cool he, he's a really cool guy um um so i showed up and and he handed me a pair of gloves and and let me um let me write serial numbers it was cool um yeah i think the most i think most sellers or whatever would not let you do that man they just would too yeah like uh that's 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 super cool i feel like rti everybody's kind of got their opinions on them and uh like i was just just in the comments of uh, our last podcast i was reading like two guys kind of going back and forth where what you know one guy had his opinion one way and then one the other um so it's kind of neat to hear from somebody who's actually been there and and talk you know talk to them and everything so yeah, they're all they're all really cool. It was neat. They 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 thought it was interesting. The you know the guys in the warehouse watching me do that. They they were, they were asking like, why, why are you doing this? And I I, I told them because it's because I want to. I don't know. That's a <laughs> labor really of an love. Answer. That's yeah, a labor I, of love. Did you yeah. tell them you're one of those psychotic pattern collectors? That uh, yeah. What was what was it, Aaron? Pattern collectors are. Oh, psychopath. Psychopath. Yeah. Psychos. Psychopath. Yeah. 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 You definitely become a psycho when you're like that focused on one thing. Which is but, cool. Um, I think I think it's cool, Cody, that you like something that's so like odd and, yeah, it's uh, how and I, pretty. It's how I wind up doing, doing this. <laughs> you don't do this unless you wind up being real into something. Yeah. It's it's neat though, man, because like that you're not just another Mauser or Mosin guy or whatever, because that's pretty yeah. underrepresented and probably in the in the collector community. Um, I, there's yeah. probably like there's probably like one other person in the whole country that that bothers collecting these. So yeah. I know a couple people in I know like one somebody in Australia that collects them. A couple people in Italy. Yeah, you need to be the guy. I don't think like, anyone cares about them over here. The vet, you need the, to meet up with the guy that collects Dutch Beaumonts. <laughs> those, yeah. cool, those are cool rifles. I know. I want a Beaumont. Who, but who do you know? A pattern collector of Dutch Beaumonts? There's like four. I think there's yeah. How many patterns are there? Like there's, there's, there's legitimately for the Italians. There's like twelve or maybe more. I, I don't remember off the top of my head. There's yeah. a lot. There doesn't there's, have there's to be somebody, a lot of them for somebody Dutch, to collect them all. Dutch modlickers. No, I don't know anybody that does pattern collecting for Dutch modlickers. The Dutch modlickers is nuts because there's like what twelve different carbines. 
Yeah, yeah, something like that. Not to mention the long rifles. Then you get yeah, the yeah. colonials, and then the uh, yeah. Indonesian kind of redos, and yeah. The Beaumonts are badass. I'd love a Beaumont. They're cool. Man. So back to the um, back to the C and Arsenal thing. Um, there. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know too much about the loads no, uh, exactly. You're just like what back, back to what I was talking about. Yeah, yeah. No, just, I, I, I want to know more. I want to no. Keep keep going. I want to know more. Yeah, yeah. Let's no no keep going. You know, I don't know exactly what they were doing with it, but um, one of the things I had mentioned is, is you know, I don't know exactly what the condition of the rifles uh, were that they were using. And I'm not saying, like, they would have taken some rifle that was in bad headspace and all messed up and shot it. But there's some things that I look for uh, in mind before I shoot them that I don't know if everybody does. Uh, and, like, a good example is a bolt like this. And you might not see it, but the bolt face is cut off. You can see the line. Yeah, I can see mm -hmm. it. They chopped the bolt face off, and they I think it's brazed a, a new bolt face onto this one, whereas the, the standard conversion just milled out the, the you know center here, and it's still one piece. So personally, I wouldn't shoot one that's got a brazed bolt face. That's good okay, to know. So, so now I'll we have... That. So now we have a separate a separate factor here is is that not all of the conversions were done the same way. Oh, there's 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 um there's different types of the conversions too. There's the ones that you see all the time, and then there's ones um, that you, you'll tell it has a much longer rail uh, bolt support rail that that sticks out the back, and it's also got more material milled out of the receiver. And then it's got cartridge stops in it, which is stupid because they're in the Carcano clip. They don't need them. But um, I don't know what the deal is with those. There's not a, not a lot of them. Well, so, pretty so small this, number. What this reminds me of is when so when Portugal did the um, their change for the 6.5 Regero to 8 millimeter, they didn't do that in a single arsenal. They shopped that out to a bunch of different yeah. uh, gunsmiths, uh, local gunsmiths, and they don't all do the same thing. So they they were all supposed to drill a hole for the eight millimeter, and then they were all supposed to X out the six point five, which is what the normal thing you see is. They don't all do that though. So I'm wondering if this is similar to this with Italy, is that they didn't have the space maybe to re arsenal all of these. So they just shopped this out. And so they, they did. Didn't There's a ton all... of them. Yeah. So they didn't all do it the same way exactly, and maybe this this uh, reputation is from a specific person or group that did it a specific way, like you're showing with that bolt. Is like, yeah, oh, I, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. I know there's I mean, a bunch guessing. of different workshops, yeah. um, but the, the, thing, the interesting thing with the bolt um, is that the uh, when you find ones where they they've cut off the bolt face and brazed on a new one. It's not always the same length. Uh, somebody sent me a photo of one where it was like the length of the, the bolt face was like half as long as this one. It was like just a tiny little segment of bolt face that was brazed on the front. I, I think maybe it was like a headspace fix. Um, I actually was sending some hmm. messages to um, the guy that wrote the Vetterly book about it. Um, and he was not yet 100% certain what the deal was with those. So he Except maybe it well. it's a headspace fix. Do what? The, the arsenals were fixing it. rifles too. Or they were making rifles rather. Yeah. yeah. So you're not going to send your rifles to, like, well, we can take Carl off the, the rifle line to do this or he can just keep making Carcanos. Like, yeah, they were just going to like local yeah. workshops, smaller places. Yeah, you don't send it to your arsenal. It's making like the, right. the Carcanos to do it. Yeah, you send it to like the, the car shop down the road and that kind of yeah. knows, you know, you know, stuff like that a little bit Shock better. Shotgun maker, but... probably, or something similar to that. Something like they they have an idea of how to do guns or metalworking, but like, yeah, yeah. Cody, I was going to ask if you could sort of give some tips for people who might have a six five or maybe are looking at one. Um, kind of like what you just said about the bolt face. Just sort of uh, tips, I guess, to try to figure out if they will be able to shoot theirs. I'll be right yeah, back. Yeah. I got I to gotta run and grab something real quick. I'll be right back. Okay. Um, so, yeah, about that, um, 
I was going to actually show, it was probably a good time to show an example of one. So this, I bought this from RGI when they did the $199 sale. Um, here's one of the things that I look for uh, when I go to decide if I want to shoot one of these. Um, if you put this in the, close the bolt, and you put it in the fired condition, hold the trigger down, see how much wiggle you got on, on your uh, bolt. So I'm going to try and get this in front of the camera here. But uh, this can actually see that bolt freely. Oh, oh back wow. Forth. Yeah. So in, in this rifle, um, if I hold the trigger down and, and you, you just, let's say you pause this as it's firing and you've got pressure in here, this bolt can move about three quarters of a millimeter back and forth. Yeah, it's kind of a big deal. So, and here's what I believe. When these rifles were first converted uh, to 6.5 Carcano, I, I believe that long-term shooting, uh, extended shooting with surplus or I guess standard issue 6.5 Carcano caused some stretching probably in the receiver back here. His lugs are all the way back here. And I think what happens is as this gap is starting to open up here and this bolt is allowed to move more freely, now what you have is, is now the bolt's accelerating backwards freely before slamming into the lugs instead of being in constant contact with them. Um, that makes the problem worse, right? That's a big now deal. You're not just, yeah. Now you're not just putting extended pressure. Now you're hammering this receiver. So I think what happens is when this starts to happen after extended periods of shooting, you either get this where your, your lugs crack. And I think if the lugs don't crack, if the lugs hold up, I think what happens is you get ones where it, it moves back enough. It's got enough wiggle room that it it can move it can pull a cartridge out and just move just enough that you lose your gas seal or you get unsupported brass and that's what causes it to blow out that's my personal belief i'm not an engineer i don't know that makes complete um, sense to me yeah looking at that but when i look at one of these this is one the first thing i pull the trigger move this this one i wouldn't shoot personally um just because it's it's really rattly it's probably one of the worst um condition Actually, Jared. Hey, hey, Cody, Cody. Yeah. yeah. Jared. yeah. I actually am an engineer. Uh -huh. yeah. Watch, watch, what, watch this bolt handle when he does this. So, this is firing, yeah. right? So yeah. you got forty thousand. Yeah, I wouldn't oh. shoot that. No. So now the uh, the opposite. you can take field gauges and actually stick it in between the receiver and the bolt base or the the bolt and. See what your gap is like. Yeah. So the 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 alternative is you get one like this. Uh, this one is the one that I shoot all the time. This one is absolutely Tight. rock solid. It, yeah. it doesn't move. There's no movement. I personally, I would shoot PPU through this. Yeah. I would, I would not feel uh, uncomfortable about sticking PPU ammo in this and shoot it. And some people do. And I think this gets back to the. The, the thing, you, you can't really make a blanket statement about these being safe or unsafe because it's really condition dependent. Um, and if you think about it, right, if just hypothetically, let's say it's 500 rounds is what these are good for. You don't know how many how many shots they, they've uh, had through them before. Um, and every shot matters a lot more than uh, the same shot from a different rifle, right? Like a Mosin that's been shot 15,000 times before you get it is going to be like exactly the same as one that's been shot 15,500 times in terms of mechanical condition. That's not the same for these because every shot has a much more significant um, impact on the overall condition. Um, so I think you really have to look at each rifle um, individually, check that action, make sure it's good. Um, a lot of the chambers are normally pretty rusty. I, I almost always have to like scrub the chambers really good because um, normally they're pretty tight to chamber around when I get them because they're just gunky. Um, so a person, gap, dude. yeah, that gap is kind of scary. So, it, so I'm that's, a, that's an inertial hammer. It's just going to keep getting worse mm -hmm. every time. Yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. And that's that's why it, you know it's really hard to you know. You don't want to just say they're all safe or they're all unsafe. It's it's really, you just need to you need to just look at them and, and actually know what you're dealing with. Um, but like I said, that rifle that's in good condition, I wouldn't be scared to put PPU in it 
I just won't do it because I collect them and I want to shoot them for ever. And I can't, every shot of PPU I put through that has taken life out of it. Um, so I, that's why I still do light loads in all of them, no matter what, for the six fives. So uh, if you were going to be putting together like a list of, of things that people need to check if they're buying one or thinking about buying one. So obviously you want to check the lugs for any cracks or deformations or anything. And then second, you want to check the wiggle. What would I... Yeah, check the Action wiggle. wiggle. And then, yeah. yeah, and then another spot that I, I um, would check is the receiver portion that's right here under this ring. Um, I, I do have one that's cracked under this ring. Oh, and that ring kind of would, would uh, cover it up so you might not see it. Well, you can see it from the front, but you don't know how bad it is until you move the ring out of the way and actually see that it's yeah. it's got a pretty significant crack here. So, um, and then the bolt yeah, face personally, thing. I just think it's... Yeah, the bolt face thing. I, I mean, I don't... Again, going back to that, you're not going to give something to your guys that's going to blow up. If you're also doing light loads, then the bolt face thing probably isn't going to be the end of the world. But, I mean, if you have an option, pick one that has a solid bolt. Yeah, because those things are pretty cheap. I've run across quite a few 6.5 better lease. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and they're, they're like usually, yeah, they're usually really inexpensive. And for like a first time, you know, you know, Milser buyer or something like that, or just on a, if you know, if you're on a budget. Uh, that's pretty tempting, you know, for a gun with such a long, you know, history and it's been in service for so long and everything to spend. But yeah, I definitely feel like you have to check a lot of things on the veteran release before, which then raises yeah. the question, because I don't think Othaya said exactly all of those things and if any of those things were wrong with those guns. Yeah, and Othaya didn't even say, as far as I remember, he didn't even say they're unsafe he just said if you're going to shoot one of these be careful and know what you're doing and, and check it out right but people don't pay attention to that part they just link to the video and say yeah, they're yeah. unsafe look watch um and that drives me nuts because i've shot i don't know how many but well over 100 rounds out of that rifle and i i only get concerned sometimes that i'm doing too low of a charge and maybe not getting enough gas seal um so if anything i i want to bump it up a little sometimes. Um, and I know some other people that shoot them that think that, yeah, a lot of that reputation is people baby them a lot more than they need to be. But, um, you shoot cast or, or copper jacket? Jacketed. Yeah, jacketed. just jacketed. Hornady, 140 grain bullets. They work, you know, because I'm not, I'm not going out doing like 200 yard sniping with it. I'm just sitting on a 50 yard line just having fun. It does just fine at that distance. Yeah, I was going to ask you, like, what what type of loading you you do for that? So I so when I first got one, like my very first one that I had was a six five Carcano one, and I you know wasn't loading smokeless powder or anything at the time. I just did black powder. I just took PPU and I pulled the bullets, filled it all the way up to the top with um, Pirate X RS. I just reseated the bullet on top and I shot it, and it, they worked fine. Um, didn't have any squibs. Um, in fact, you probably got a little extra accuracy from fouling, tightening up the bore. When you're using the 264, maybe. But um, yeah. so that works. That's a pain in the ass to clean black powder mm -hmm. out of something that small, though. Um, wouldn't recommend. It's it. Almost like there's a reason they didn't they didn't go that small yeah, with yeah, black yeah. powder. Yeah. So um, I did that. Um, I did try. Some people done like 50% PPU. I did 60%. It worked, but I, I I I settled with IMR forty one ninety eight. That's the same stuff I use for the ten point fours. Um so I use in the Mauser it's uh, seventy one eighty four. Yeah, yeah. I so um for the ten point four millimeters I'm using around twenty two to twenty four grains of IMR forty one ninety eight and it works well with that two hundred forty grain cast bullet. Um that's a pretty mild load. I'm not doing anything crazy with those. Do you um, put anything on top of it? Um, I have done, yeah, I've done like a little cotton ball and tear it up yep. and, and get it just kind of light and just stuff it yeah. down there. Yeah, I but did I've, that. I've, the, the thing, the great like struggle of trying to learn reloading stuff is like no matter, the more you search, the more conflicting 
answers you find. And like, I spent hours of reading about that and came up with like an equal list of people saying always use the filler and people saying never use the filler. I always use the filler just to keep the powder against the primer for nothing else than just more consistent ignition. Yeah. And it pisses off all the people at the range because you shower them in confetti. Yeah, yeah, no, Surprise! that is pretty fun with the filler. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's on fire too. Surprise! <laughs> <laughs> it really does. They're like out there trying to shoot their hunting rifles, and it's like that or cream of wheat. It's just like, <laughs> yeah, the cream of wheat's fun. I like that. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Man, what kind so, of gun is that? Oh, it shoots confetti. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had for the six five. Sorry, go ahead. I, I had someone who's like, at least my gun's on a party favor. I'm like, it's fun. <laughs> So for the uh, for the six fives, um, I've been doing, and this is this is what I personally do. This is not my saying. Go load this way and shoot it, and you're done. Um, what I've been doing is just twenty grains of IMR forty one ninety eight and the six five Carcano with the same hundred forty grain jacketed bullet. Really, really mild. I mean, it's like little bit of recoil. It's like sh nothing. Love it. That's a high bulk, low yield powder. It works really good in a lot of that stuff because it's it's big and bulky, so it fills the case up, so you get good ignition. Yeah, but yeah, it, you get pretty you get pretty good case fill with that with like twenty ish grains. Um, yeah. Like it, so, but it um, gives you that. So you get nice ignition, but it gives you that nice low pressure rise. So. Yeah. So, um, I I say I probably go shoot uh, veterans like every other week or something like that at least once a month. I normally bring them out to the range and blast around with them. And the most fun part of that is people walk up and want to know what the heck they are. Pretty funny. Yeah. Somebody asked me if it was a Turkish rifle. I said no. <laughs> That's a good guess, though. Like, I guess, yeah. You no. Know. Yeah. That's. I guess that's better than like, what type of Mosin's that? That's or what, what I was type thinking. of Mauser? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it's similar with. Every, one of those cracks. every rifle, every bolt action rifle with a single stack magazine is a Mosin. Yeah. That's true. It's true. So Cody, your first your first Milserp was a, a Mosin, right? And yeah. then what like I when it. I bubbed it. Oh you did you don't have to talk yeah, about that if you don't I, want to. Yeah, no no no. I, I, I didn't do that bad. I just stained it. I sanded it and stained it, but I've oh. since gone back and tried to remove the finish as best I can, but yeah, everybody kind of makes everybody everybody kind of does something like that when they're starting out. They don't know any yeah. better because you're like you're like 18 now. You get a Mosin. It's like oh cool. Let me. What can I do to this? Right. In fact, I think I was like I I took apart like the trigger group and I was like filing something to give it like a a lighter trigger. <laughs> And now I can't ever sell it because if you just take it, you just whack the butt stock on the ground, it'll fire. So now oh, I just determined that I have to keep it forever because I can't. There's no way I can sell that. <laughs> just get trigger parts for next to nothing. Yeah, I should probably do that. <laughs> yeah. So how did you go from your your Mosin into just deep diving into Vetterlies? It's origin story time here. Yeah, I get, yeah. It's not like some big glorious um, story to it. Um, I just, I saw him in Battlefield One, and I just I knew because I knew enough about you know I've been into Milserp enough that I knew when I saw him in the game. Like as soon as I saw them listed, and it said like Vetterly eighteen seventy slash eighty seven, I'm like, oh, that's like a first generation black powder rifle with some sort of update being used in World War One. That's Cool. And I tried it out in the game, and I'm like, oh, "This is a really funky looking gun." And then I bought one, and then I bought eleven more, and then it just went all all down that hill. Um, but uh, no, they're they're neat guns, and they they're definitely not appreciated because I think yeah, they get that reputation because um, you know when they were imported and here in like the fifties, the forties, fifties. Like the 6.5 Carcano ones, they were just advertised as like Italian sniper rifles. And they would come with 100 rounds of surplus ammo. 
They didn't say anything about it being an emergency conversion or, so people would just buy them and shoot them with full power ammo. So yeah, they probably ran into the problems of beating them to crap until they finally gave up. And that's why now people are, yeah, I was going to say, wants them, they're scared of them. They say, don't shoot them because yeah, if you don't know what you're doing, you just go into a store, buy one and throw PPU in it without checking anything. Then yeah, that's going to be a lot more dangerous than if you go Not into the store, PPU. grab a Mosin, and stick. You're talking back in the day. Too. You're talking Italian surplus back yeah. in the day. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean now because now they've all been shot to crap after being imported 50, 60 years ago, right? Yeah. Yeah, and that's um, so interesting. Yeah, if you walk into a store today and do that, the chances of something going wrong if you just pick one up today out of a store and throw PPU in it. It's a lot higher than if you just walked into the store and grabbed a Mosin and stuck some surplus ammo in it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's so interesting too. Cause like with that gun, like you said, it's, it's not like you're concerned about barrel life. You're concerned about like receiver life or like yeah, bolt life. I, I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Cause that does make a lot of sense. You can't cut away at the receiver and really expect it to, to keep that much rigidity or, or life to it with those rear locking lugs. I don't and know. Not just cut away, Danny. Cut away and increase the pressure twice. You're doing it. Yeah. I didn't I didn't realize that there was a, a an intermediate step where they increased the the pressure. I thought they just went from ten point three black powder to six point five percano. I didn't realize there was a spot in between where they were using smokeless ten point three. And yeah. and then you and then you go oh yeah here's a bolt that's from a ten point three gun that's that's the, the 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 lugs are broken and I'm like what those yeah, are supposed that, to be the safe ones yeah <laughs> that gun um that gun is a, a military police carbine single shot chambered in the ten point four um and it's got the smokeless powder sights updated so I, I know it's been shot with that. Uh, I don't know if it was maybe that could have just been somebody that had it here and was trying to hand load and overdid it and cracked lugs because it's the original. Um, what's this one? It, I know this is the original um, bolt collar to that rifle because this is like just this is like getting into like nerd details here. But see how this is cut flat right here on this one. Yep. And this one is angled. Um, yep. The original single shot. Because you were just opening it up and then grabbing a cartridge and putting it in, um, when they when they made them a magazine uh, repeater, they added a little angled piece on the receiver and then they they uh, cut that at an angle to help you just run it quicker and it just make it more reliable. Um, so this is the original one that was on that rifle, um, and I don't know what somebody did to it, but they messed it up. They shot the bejesus out of it. That's what they did. They really did, but the bores like mirror shiny it's like perfect if you take care of it it'll be all right yeah i've got a lot of them that i that i you know i just won't shoot because they're just they're too good a shape and i don't want to mess with them um though i did shoot my 1870 the the expensive one single shot I had to do it I, I had to do it once yeah the single shot because i've never seen any videos of them being fired ever because like no one has a one like they're the only ones that are out there are like floating around in Italy. That's how I got mine to import it. Um, Who'd you yeah. import it through? Um, well, they just shipped it. It's an antique. I, there was, I don't think there was an official import. Like, oh, like it's when a, any problems coming th from Italy? No, they shipped it. You know, it's crazy. So when you buy something, when you buy from Italy, it, it's, there's like six weeks waiting for the paperwork to clear from the uh, Italian police. And they shipped it UPS. Um, it was from Italy to my my place in like five days. I mean, it really? seems, yeah, wow. they, they fly it over and then it goes through customs. And I had to call UPS, the, the UPS office at the airport and give them my social security number for them to clear it. Because that was because the value was like over twenty five hundred bucks, so they had to have a social security number to clear it, um, and then they cleared it. No, no customs, no duties, straight to my house. Well, I just bought a Kharkov parka from England. We'll see how long it takes to get here. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Then. 
Yeah, that's pretty neat. I feel like it should be it should be that easy to get like a, a Mauser or something too. It should be. Nuts. It's called yeah. a CNR. They show up at your door. No, I'm from another country is what I mean. I don't know if the CNR helps you export it from. I doubt it. I don't think it really has anything to do with it whatsoever. I don't think it would either. Yeah. It, other than it would yeah, come to your door. Another country is not going to care. Yeah, it would. It would just come to your door instead of going to the store. That's really the only difference. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I know because that's what Mike had to deal with. Remember, Danny, because he imported a bunch of stuff from South Africa. Yeah. Two or yeah. three guns. Yeah. Yeah. But those were those were not antiques. Those were eighteen ninety eight mm -hmm. past or whatever. So I don't know I don't know how that works with antiques. I guess it depends on the exporting country's laws. And then I guess with what he's just said for importing as far as the United States is concerned, it's not a firearm. So it's it it would yeah. really just depend on the exporting country's requirements, I guess. I've wondered if there's like a burden of proof sort of thing where like you have to prove it's an antique and not like a, not a real I would think firearm. That would be on the, I think that would be on the exporting country's requirements because they would have to prove to the United States that Yeah, they, is, they put a label on the box. Yeah. Because that, that has to be part of their exporting like requirements, I would say, is that it can't leave or go to the United States unless it's X, Y, Z or whatever. Yeah, when I got my when I got my crate when they shipped it over here, like there's a big paper uh, tape to the front that that was you know certifying that it was antique. Um, hmm. uh, the place I got it from only deals in antiques, so I think the they, they had it all. They put the date on the bear or on the rifle anywhere. The Doesn't dates, matter where. The dates are on the barrels on the Vetterlies, not even. Yeah, the that's the nice thing. They dated them. Like a lot of countries dated their rifles instead of us, where it's like, yeah, it's a Remington. When's it made? Yo, you know, World War Two ish. Like where every other country in Europe was like, bam, uh, this year. Uh, uh, not Austro Hungary. Uh, yeah, they didn't do that. They didn't do that. <laughs> yeah, I was just all thinking the of that. Countries were like, bam, date. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, they, they didn't do that with Austro-Hungarian M95s. Just so, you, just so you know, just so you know. Yeah, I was going to say cool. the the Swiss the Swiss didn't do it because I was just thinking about what antiques I have, and I'm like, oh, my two Swiss antiques. Yeah, Swiss aren't. didn't do it. Yeah, the serial number datum. Yeah, which is like, like again, how do you prove that that's correct to yeah. whatever authority? To it's, I don't know. but that's what I'm saying. You don't have to prove it. The country exporting it has to prove it. That's that's the that's the thing is that the United States doesn't give a shit about you as a individual. Uh, political commentary, <laughs> spicy. <laughs> uh, no, they they only care about okay, is what they're saying it is, aka the country exporting the the company exporting is that truly what it is? And so that's what he's saying is that there was a paperwork certifying it so that. If it isn't, if it's found to be not true, then they can go back after that country or that company uh, or that individual and, 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 and pursue them for essentially gun trafficking at that point. Mm. So, like, yeah, I'm sure there's all kinds of paperwork and shit they had to fill out, but it's not, it's not the burden of proof isn't on you as the individual. It's on the seller. Hmm. Alrighty, I feel like I need to start looking in various countries for antiques now. I mean, they're going to be expensive, Danny. They're, what? they're a lot less. I heard everything in Europe's cheap. They're a lot less uh, regulated. That's just just like it is here. I mean, there there is not as not a, not a, not in all the countries in Europe, but uh, black powder is a lot less regulated than um, uh, smokeless powder stuff. It's just the way it is. I just know what's going to happen. He's going to go to Germany and he's going to call me from Germany. It's going to be like 4 a.m. He's like, hey, man, I just bought this needle gun. Can you make ammo for me? What? How do you reload a pin fire round? Yeah, like, I, I just, I know this. <laughs> like, that's what's going to happen. Like, hey, man, uh, I'm going to Dusseldorf and I bought this really cool needle gun. Can you make actually, ammo? Actually, <laughs> 
I don't know. I, we'd have to ask Platts in France, but I know Germany and France like to do the proofing loads where you have, if you sell it, you have to proof it. Mm, yeah. So I don't know if that's the same for export or if it's the same for black powder rifles. So, uh, yeah, I've seen some M 95s where they've been through Germany. They stamped the shit out of those. Those are like 14 different proof marks, stamping marks, all kinds of armory marks and everything like that. They have to be marked. They have to be proofed. They have to be, have the the proofing house on it. They have to have the 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 caliber. They have to have when it was done, and it's like all these different stamps, and they just stamp all over the whole thing. So yeah, it, I'm glad it, it's I'm glad it's not just the U.S. that ruins them with import marks. Somebody, yeah. Somebody well, I mean is. that. Yeah, that that's anytime. I I think in France. I don't know. I'm not. An, I'm not in France, obviously. But I, from talking to Plas, I think he said that. Any time where it's a sale, it has to be confirmed by the gunsmith, and it has to be proof shot by the gunsmith. They don't restamp it every time, but it has to be checked and confirmed as safe to shoot. And if it's not, then they have to be rendered inoperable. Yeah, if you're if you still sell it, that's what I mean. If you don't sell it, yeah. I think you can keep it to fix it. But I don't. You can't sell it if it's not safe to shoot. Essentially. <laughs> yeah, that's a doozy. Hey, speaking of one thing though, on, on antiques that I just thought was interesting, um, I do notice that there are a lot of people get confused with the six five Carcano Vetterlies about whether they're an antique or not because they're rechambered to six five Carcano, which is a modern available round. So. I've had a mix of like times where they they want an FFL, and I had one make me do a background check for it, even though I said, "Like, dude, I've got like nine of these. There's no background check. They don't care." And then, yeah, they're they're like, "You're gonna do one." I said, "Like, dude, look at the date. It says like 1886." He's like, "Well, yeah, but they rechambered it for six five Carcano." I don't know, but I mean, as far as I know, they're, they're still an antique because oh, man. it's the Tiger Imports is selling them as antiques. It's original manufacturer. Yeah. It's yeah. yeah. It's like I I run into that a lot. One time it's well, it's on our books. So if it's on our books, we got to do a forty four seventy three. And then uh, and then there's just a uh, complete ignorance of antique laws and whatever. There's, it's a gun. I got to check it. You know. There's and, complete uh, ignorance of CNR licenses. I yeah, don't know that what that. Good. I never heard of that. I'll show you. Yeah. I don't know what that is. Yeah. I never heard of. It. So. And I know one gun dealer, he knows about the antique, you know, exception or whatever, where it doesn't need to be, but he's a stout believer in everybody doing background checks. So he will do a background check on, on, hey, on an antique for it? just because, just because he, he thinks everybody should have to go through a background check. I had the, Danny, you remember I had the guy argue with me about the 1890 Mauser 1891 I bought that was made by, uh, Louva. So, oh yeah. yeah so like this country this company does not exist after 1895 there's no way it's not an antique <laughs> yeah. oh no it has to go to an ffl and i'm like okay well, i'm ffl03 i don't recognize that as a, an actual ffl that's a fake ffl and i'm like fine <laughs> yeah i sent okay, a friend fine. of mine and he goes do i put this on my books because he's an ffl regular uh, or, a regular FFL. A real one, uh, you mean? A real one, a sorry. Real, yeah. <laughs> and he goes, so I put this on my books, and I said, I wouldn't. It was built in this company. You see this company on here, this this rail? That company doesn't exist after 1895. Yeah. There's, there's no way it's not an antique. And he goes, oh, okay. And I'm like, cool, thanks. I was like, here's your 20 bucks for bothering you. <laughs> I never understand that. And I know it's I've up done. to the company and I know it's up to the dude like Yeah. Why? Yeah, I've done I've done transfers for for antiques before and it's just yeah. like you're really going to make me okay. If this wasn't a good deal, I'd be pissed, but uh yeah. whatever. It's then, fine. It's just you're ignorant to the law and yeah. I have to pay you money. And that's well, that's, that's what gets me. 
what the who was the what was the name of the lawyer guy we had on here? Matt. 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 Yeah. So Matt. Matt had the saying of um, don't don't add more laws or something like that. Oh, don't add don't. more burden to yourself. Like you're it's, you're adding it, more. No, it's it's like you're. Oh oh oh. Like oh you're, yeah. You're you're making Shit. the laws more intense than they actually are. Like you're making Shit. it more complicated yeah. than Yeah. Damn it. He had it. Yeah, he had a good had a saying good about that. I forgot what it was. Dang it. it yeah, something like it, and and the saying is is totally true. Like you're making the system self-regulation is the pro, like that's the first part of it. And like get educated. And the, like I have the one store that I go to all the time that I bought all the shit off of. And they always make me do a 4470. I'm like, I have a CNR license. They don't know what it is. They just, they refuse to learn what it is. And if it wasn't $3 to get a right, to get the, whatever it is transferred over, I would bitch. But it's three bucks. Like, that's a pretty good price. Hey, that's a, a, a big double, you know? Yeah. Are they three bucks like, now for a McDouble? It's like two fifty. Back in my day. Back in my day, in the dollar menu had yeah. items on it that were a dollar. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That's my own personal axe to grind. It's like if you don't know what it is, but it's got all the same shit that you have on yours, maybe you should educate yourself and figure out what the hell you're doing. But yeah. that would involve learning. You know, another one that I see with them not knowing what they're doing is uh, shipping ammo by USPS. I've had people, I buy ammo and it shows up by USPS. And then I, I go, like, why did you ship this by USPS? And they're like, what? Yeah, they're like, huh? what, what about it? It's like, dude, if anything happened to this package, you'd be in jail. Like, if anyone found out, you're losing your license, you're going to jail, you're done. Yeah. And and I've seen sellers like on Gunbroker that like they, they'll sell ammo and they'll have it listed. Well, we will ship USPS. I'll send them a question like, you know, you can't do that, right? No, no response. Yeah. It just it's ridiculous. It's, same. It's, a, it's a mail bomb. Yeah. <laughs> he made a mail bomb. It's, I, I was it's, like, what are you doing? <laughs> it's like shipping fuel samples air. You can't ship a fuel sample air. It has to be ground. You can't put fuel plane <laughs> I yeah. mean you can they you can know about it yeah like if it leaks you're going to jail <laughs> like, I have shipped guns via UPS and we have a distribution center here and I've had to take it there and every single time I've done it three times every single time they have had to go on and get the manager because they're like, you can't, you can't ship guns, <laughs> and I'm like, yes, yes, I can. Yeah. And they're like, no, you can't, and I'm like, no, I can. I've done it twice now. Go get the manager, please. And the manager comes out and was like, what's the problem? And they're like, he's trying to ship a gun. And I'm like, and he's like, so. <laughs> yeah. Every well, single time, it was like, you can't do that. And I'm like, yes, I can. Just so you know, Aaron, those days are over. I know, I know, but. Uh, but that was that was funny to me because the so I, I first went to the UPS store. Turns out those are not managed by UPS; those are done independently. So you can't do shit like that there. You have to take it to the distribution center. So luckily, the distribution center from the store is like a mile away. So I went to the distribution center, and every single time it was an argument. Yeah, I know. I like, yeah you can't do that. I'm like, yes, I can. Yeah, when I lived in Washington and I sold I sold a I sold my M1 for the Jungman and that was like a whole damn hassle trying to find somebody that would accept it so that I could mail this thing out and it was like going from place after place and talking to this person and this employee and the manager and whatever just to find yeah. Yep. I like yeah. one of the UPS distribution center cuz they're they're like, "Hey, is this a gun?" Yeah. Oh, cool! What is it? Like they they didn't care. They were like, "Oh yeah, it's this." Oh, that's awesome, man! That's awesome. Yeah, I just walk out. Like, speaking of weird shit, UPS. I saw, I for some reason I've been re like you get recommended YouTube shorts. You know, we were talking about shorts, Danny. Mm -hmm. I got been recommended this this one 
really intense interview with this guy that used to be like a really high level like drug trafficker in the United States. And I think and I've seen this. He's talking, to, he's talking about yeah. like we we never sent sent stuff UPS or FedEx because it goes to a distribution center and they know it and they steal it. We we would we would we would expect to lose about sixty percent of our product anytime it went through UPS or FedEx. USPS almost one hundred percent delivery, and we're like, what? I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like they figured it out real fast at UPS and FedEx. They got that figured out, and they would steal it. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't be like it would get caught and they would get in trouble. It was like, no, it would just disappear. Yeah, just employees would take it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he's not talking like he's not talking like bricks of cocaine. He's talking about marijuana. But I'm like, they just would take it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, are we talking to? Uh, I mean, we can go over like pattern collecting. I know we're all getting kind of tired. It's like twelve. Yeah, it's like. It. Like it's all 30 here. Time. Yeah. Real time. I mean, I think the same reason, I think we both got into it for the same reason. It, they were cheap and available. Right, Cody? Yeah. No, that, that's definitely a good thing. Um, but, you know, there's there's pros and cons to it. We find I, it interesting. I, 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 yeah, you find it interesting. Like, one pro, there's a pro and a con here that are, like, exactly the same. Pro, you're less likely to overpay when you, re- when you know, like, everything. Like, like I can pick up, you can hand me a federally and I can know like pretty much everything I need to know about it in like 30 seconds to know exactly like, all right, this is worth this much and everything looks good or bad. So you're, you're less likely to overpay for stuff like that, but then you're also more likely to overpay for other things. Like, because when you're like all focused on pattern collecting, if you're missing like one thing and you get an opportunity to buy it, you'll pay like double, triple the, you know, You'll pay way over what everybody else would pay, so you overpaid. But for you, it's like I gotta have that. So, like, like for me, my back in the day, this was like overpaying for when I bought, uh, I bought the, my M95 rifles that were uh, the Czech rifle, the Czech produced BRNO, and then also the M95 24. I paid five hundred dollars each for those. So. Those that's that's high end M95s. Uh, even nowadays, that's that's high end M95s. But back when I bought those, that was like holy shit! You you got screwed. But like those are very rare. Like those are five thousand produced or under, both of them. And it's like so. Like you're saying, you're right. Is that oh yeah? I'm gonna overpay for it because I know what it is. And and versus somebody that's ignorant of it like we were just talking before the podcast uh, somebody on on one of the facebook groups for the n95s they found a extremely who knows how rare prototype uh, m95 with a folding an underfolding bayonet which kind of similar to an sks where it has the the underfolding bayonet and that that was a, a legit prototype who knows how many were made nobody knows and he just found it at a gun show and it's like he didn't probably overpay for that because nobody knew what it was and versus danny today found an m95 24 for 800 dollars because that guy knew what it was so that's that's the problem is is that with a pattern collecting especially with obscure stuff like me and you have gotten into is that there's not a lot of people that know what they are they just don't know what the price of it Luckily, you can get lucky and get some really cheap ones, or you can get screwed. I got really lucky with a so for the uh, little Vetterly cavalry carbines. They have a little socket bayonet that uh, you reverse Ooh. and it goes into the stock. A lot of times, you find those and they're missing the the socket bayonet. No bayonet on them. And without the bayonet, they're like a four or five hundred dollar little carbine. Uh, with the bayonets, though, they're only they're worth like eight seven to nine hundred bucks right so bayonet adds a couple hundred bucks worth of value i got mine was like 830 bucks for mine um, even though it's not matching with the socket bayonet but you will never find a veterly socket bayonet on its own because of just how how few of them there are and when once they get separated if they're not attached to the rifle then nobody knows what they are right and they're just gone forever um, and I was I was looking because I, I got a military police carbine that takes the same the military police carbine 
uses the same bayonet as the cavalry carbine, um, but it didn't have a bayonet. So I started looking and I was reading forum posts from people um, and, and like one person said, I found one in 25 years and it went for like 1500 bucks. So it's weird because like the bayonet on its own will sell for more than the bayonet and the rifle combined would because finding one on its own is so hard that somebody who has the rifle but needs the bayonet will pay a lot for it. And there are really, like, nobody would ever know what they look like um, if, if you showed it to them. They wouldn't know what it was. I found one last year at a estate auction in Maryland and got it for 90 bucks because it was just listed as antique bayonet. And I, as soon as I saw it, I went, that's a Vetterly socket bayonet. And I bought it because nobody was going to bid against me. Once I got it up to like 90 bucks, they're like, no, because they just thought it was just some bayonet. But like, that's the nice thing when you, when you get really into pattern collecting stuff and you know, every marking, you know, every angle of something like you can identify stuff and, and pick stuff out. And I really like that because you're, you're not going to get shafted nearly as much. I don't think. Yeah, I was going to, about pattern collecting, I was going to say, I think you, Cody and, and Aaron, you guys are the big pattern collectors because you all kind of like m most of your collection, like 90% or whatever is probably the same sort of system. I think, yeah. uh, I think Jared and I are both Mauser fans. I probably, most of our guns are Mausers, but we have like a lot of different types of rifles and stuff. I like wouldn't that. say you're a pattern collector, Danny. If if your Mauser collection was all Swedish, then I could say you're a pattern collector. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of weird. Like I thought about it because like if I sold everything except for Swedes, then I would be a, like a Swede pattern collector. Mm -hmm. But yeah, on its own, I guess it's there's like a certain ratio or something where where you become one. But I was talking to I was talking to a guy one time who's who's real big into Finn Mosens. And he knows I kind of like everything. And I bought something weird. And he's like, what the hell did you buy? That's so that's so odd, you know, because it, it seemed really random to him. He's like, you need to specialize. He's like, you got to specialize on something and just and just kind of stick with it instead of buying all this odd stuff. But his thing was uh, fins. He just only, he bought Finnish everything. Every every gun the, fin, the fins ever used. And that was like his thing and his focus. And he's crazy about it. And he's got rare stuff and whatever. Um, See that? That that just works from my personality too, though. Is that I I I got to the point where I just was like, I just have too many random things. I'd like to just focus in on one thing, and that's just how I am. Is that I was just like I wanted to be focused on something and on one specific item, and it just happened to be the M ninety five. It could have been anything at that point. I mean, we were talking, Danny, about me doing. Um, the I was the eight millimeter hipster, remember? Oh yeah, we yeah. Gonna, uh -huh. I was gonna yeah. do all the different eight millimeter calibers, but not eight millimeter Mauser. Like, there's a ton of them actually that I didn't even know existed, like Murata and stuff like that. Um, and then I started looking into how much those would cost, and I'm like, holy crap, this is ridiculous! I'm not buying a two thousand dollar Japanese rifle and never shooting it. Yeah, what, just so you could say you have point. that that eight millimeter. Yeah, yeah. and so and you just, I'm not going to buy more than one. Hell no. So uh, that that to me just struck that out the window, and then I don't know where or how it ended up being that I started with the M95s. I had one in my collection already. It was a JNG sales pickup. I didn't. It was just like RTI. It's a lottery. You got a, you didn't you got a a. a uh, a gallery of like here's like a couple of them we had that were out when we took a picture and i ended up with one and that's the one that went semi fully automatic um the the one that slam fires semi bolt action uh, yeah uh so but i don't i i honestly don't know where it came from uh, i just i bought a second one and then it just spiraled i don't know i just lost it yeah i get you're... Bored. That's that's why I don't do it. You get bored. I get bored because that's I like Danny to said. shoot them. Yes, when you, when you collect a lot of different things, when you get a new, I don't know what you are like. When I get a new gun, it's like staying by my side for a couple of days so I can play yes. with it before it gets put away. 
when you collect a lot, like everything, each one's like fun and new. Like when I get another Vettelie, it's like, all right, yep, this is this is great. I know everything I need to know about this. Clean it up, put it away. So you do lose that. Um, that your, that your was my thing. Collector. Like, I mean, I have a bunch of Mausers, and I I have a bunch of stuff that like I have to shoot. To me, I have to shoot them. They have to be able to be shot, and I want to be able to make some of them shootable. So. I've gotten less and less off that shooting path because well, I mean, I shoot yeah. to the two kids and then just the way the finances yeah. have been I, and with COVID and everything, it's just... Can't buy primers. It's, it's just not <laughs> oh, been a yeah. thing. So, like, I don't think I've shot a gun in over two years, probably over three at this point. And, uh, like, it's... Like, I, I'm still buying stuff. It's just I, I don't... I don't know if I would buy something that was obviously broken, uh, but I I'm not opposed to it as much as I used to be. Let me put it that way. <laughs> I don't know. I, like I have, one, two, three, I have four Mosins M ninety one thirties. I have like a hex, a nice round receiver, a shitty round receiver, and a fin. I don't need to buy any more 9130s, even though my brother has one that I'm probably going to buy as trade fodder. But that's but would like. You, but would you buy an Imperial 91? Yeah, I have one. Danny sold me one. Yeah, okay. So that's another Mosin, though. It's still a Mosin. Oh, 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 I have Mosins. I'm not buying M9130s. Mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a 2830. I have an M90, uh, M39. So, like, to me, it's the pattern is like Pokemon. I want to catch them all. Not just one at the same time. I'm not just talking to get all the different, yeah. All the whole damn decks, all right? <laughs> he doesn't want every version of Pikachu that existed. Yeah. He wants every... But you got a shiny. Yeah, exactly. And also, like, there's Pikachu with a surfboard. Nope, this don't is, care. It's all fucking rats. This is some, right? uh, this is some Pokemon trading card game uh, yeah. deep lore, guys. This is, yeah. this is it. So, this yeah. Is this is where we're going to start talking about oh, yeah. uh, NFTs, guys. Digimon so versus Pokemon. Millsurp World NFT right now, <laughs> and it's an image. It's an image of a donkey kicking <laughs> in the ass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah, the, to say it is like I don't. I get bored, and it's easy to. What I think what you said, Cody, is kind of kind of hits hits the nail on the head because it's if you have yeah if you already have ten plus of them and you buy another one and it's got to be real special to kind of stand out from all the other ones, which odds are probably isn't that much. And then yeah, and then it's just kind of yeah. like okay, got another one and but I, I don't know i don't know if that's like a personality thing or, or whatever where like you're you're okay with that and you you like that you want to stay in your comfort zone or, or something you or... end up having odd reasons for buying guns i think when mm -hmm. you're like pattern collecting like i bought a gun i bought a veteran that had like holes in it where it was mounted up on a wall and one of the holes where they drilled through it got the barrel a little bit not that it was like it wasn't structurally bad but i think overall the bore was shot but I bought it because the cartouche, when they converted it to 6.5 Carcano, was, like, perfect. I literally spent, like, 300 bucks on the gun just for the stamp. Never shot it. Just sits in there just for the stamp. You wouldn't do that for any other reason. Like, and, just come up yeah. with odd reasons to buy this. Like, I need this gun because of that stamp. And I've bought a couple just for stamps. I'm just stuff. thinking of the hilarity that, like, they just didn't come up with a hanger. They just fucking screwed the gun. Oh, oh, that's what hey, they did. That hey, looks like it's what they did. Charlie, come here and hold this up against the wall while I Just screw, screw it in there. What it's type like of yeah. bit where it skipped? You know. Yeah. yeah, they just wanted generic old gun on the wall for decor at that place. Yeah. At yeah. that at that old Cracker Barrel or something, and, <laughs> that's and they is. just that's screwed it on there. Barrel. Yeah. I have seen like uh, military stuff at like Cracker Barrel, like oh, up yeah. on the wall and shit. Like I'm like, what the. What is that doing up there? Yeah, every now and then, yeah, I'll see like a shotgun or something like at a at one of like a themed restaurant or something on the wall. It's like yeah. Like or the, the guy in our Discord that that found the uh, oh no, it was Sam, wasn't it? Sam found that uh, 
um, that gun store with the the wall of M95 long rifles. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was like yeah. 70 or 80 M95 long rifles just in a straight row, and I'm like, "Where's this at, Sam? Where is this located, Sam?" But unfortunately, they appear to be all missing their bolts, and some of them are missing other parts too. It looks like so it's probably just a bunch of stocks and shit, but or maybe barreled actions, but unfortunate. But it does look like they're pretty beat up. <laughs> maybe he took the bolts out and he put them in a box or something. It's probably what it is, but the there's attic. a lot, and they weren't all they weren't short rifles at all. They were all long rifles, and that was like, whoa, okay, that's weird. Yeah, I always hate that though when you see it in a store and they're like up off somewhere because it's like that's not for sale. That's just they have like no mill serps for sale, but they got like you know twenty on display. Yeah, it's like yep. you. I, yeah, I see that, and that that drives me nuts. I was at a gun store pretty far away that I dropped into, and they had all modern stuff. And then like up in the corner, there's a couple mill serps, and there's a Gewehr eighty eight with a hundred dollar price tag on it. And I said. I want that. And he goes, uh, it's not for sale. I said, like, it says a hundred bucks. And he's like, no, it's not for sale. That, that or type you, of stuff drives me crazy. You get that or you get like the one mill serp and you're like, oh, what's the cool car in any 8AZ, you know? Oh, yeah, that's like 1200 bucks. It's all mismatched import markets. Why? Well, I saw my gun broken for sale that much. No, no. No, that's, that's, okay, there you go. There's like the number one thing when you find something and you go, how much do you want for this? Gun broker, they go straight to gun broker, yep. and that's and then they go uh, fourteen hundred bucks, and you yeah. just you just want to like throw it at them and be like, come on, dude. Yeah, I hate that. Well, my my personal favorite is the gun store here that that has and it still has a heavily moder modernized uh, yeah, M ninety one thirty with like a muzzle brake that is literally like this long and that thick. It looks like a fucking Barrett 50 cal muzzle brake that they shoved on the end of this gun. It weighs like 40 pounds because they've just weighted it. It's supposed to be like this massive, like accurate long range thing. And I'm just like, and they want like $2,000 for it. I'm like, why? That's what just like, a, that's just like a conversation oh, piece or something at that point. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, it's all tricked up. Like the stock's all—it's not an archangel or whatever that is. It's actually like a custom stock or whatever, and it's all black. Everything's been like creocoded black, and it's like just made to look like this fucking like awesome looking thing. And it's like a 1942 Tula or whatever round receiver. I'm just like, what? What? Why did you? Well, who did this? What did you do this for? For fun? Mm. It wasn't for profit. Cause it's been there for five years. <clears throat> you know, I was I was working at a gun show and a guy bought a ninety one thirty, and as he was walking away, I heard him say something about put it putting it in an Archangel stock. Like, yeah, we're gonna put this in that Archangel stock and blah blah. Like as he's walking away, like he was gonna do it, and I was just like, oh, son of a bitch, people are still doing that. You know, I was just thinking about it, and then I went, oh fuck, I should go ask him if I could like have his stock or like buy it for like 20 bucks or something off. You're just going to throw this away, right? I'll pay 20 bucks for it. Like that sort of thing just to keep it. Cause I have a couple, I have a couple, uh, Mosin stocks. I have a, a 9130 stock with the hardware and, uh, an M38 or M44, like the, the carbine stock, just cause I found it for probably somebody did exactly that with it. And then the stocks ended up who knows where. And so I picked them up for cheap, but, uh, Find the handguards, man, the handguards is what everybody always yeah. is looking for. Yeah, I think mine have the handguards. Yeah. Yeah. First thing you go. It's always the first thing. Always. I found a I found a beautiful uh Imperial M ninety one. What's the what's the weird name? The really long named arsenal? Like Oh, four, that was in the trivia nine. the other day. That's for yes. Yeah, what the I don't Peter? Know how to pronounce it. Oh. I, yeah, it's really long. It's like a bunch of lines and beautiful, perfect thing the stock wasn't uh the the stock wasn't uh cut up but they took the handguard and threw the handguard away the stock was fine they didn't mess with it they just took the handguard off and i'm just like why <laughs> what was the point of this you saved two two ounces bubba's gonna bubba and 
And then I was like, well, maybe I can find a handguard. Oh, no, fuck, you can't. Imperial M91 handguards? Good luck mm-hmm. with that. Well, a lot of the fins were imported that way. They took the handguards off. I don't know. Don't don't bitch at me. Bitch the fucking importers. <laughs> like, in the 90s. Yeah. I don't get that. Like, oh, it was sporterizing. It was, you know, to make it more like... I'm like, but that's not saving weight. You're not two... An ounce or two ounces. You're not... In fact, you're making Carry it worse. five extra cartridges I've with seen, that weight. Come on. You're making it worse because yeah. now you're gonna your hand's going to touch the barrel and you're going to burn your fucking hand. I've seen a few, like, lots, like, uh, parts, like Mauser parts or whatever, lots of stuff and it was all like i was like wow there's a lot of neat random like arasaka parts or whatever and it was just because there's like a gunsmith who like for 50 years sporterized guns so he just has handguards and like all this plethora of of like spare parts because he just shot up so many I mean, he kept know, chopped up so many guns at least yeah he didn't throw it away yeah yeah at least he did um i should have bought a lot more of it when i when i came across some of it but uh yeah, I bought quite a few of it. I think I sent I sent pictures to the group chat when I bought a bunch of random stuff. Like he sporterized like uh, the the uh, the German twenty two DSWs, the twenty two trainers. Don't know why, but there's bags of like just like handguards and parts for those, just because he cut the stocks up on them. And so I'm like, yeah, I'll people take the... paid money, they wanted them sporterized. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I still meet I still meet older older gentlemen every now and then that are like one guy he had a bunch of them I bought one from him and he was like Yeah, back in the day I uh sport used to sporterize these. He, he at least he said it like with some shame instead of you know. It's like man, that was really stupid. <laughs> yeah. The one that gets me I had somebody suggest that to me. Yeah. That's that's what gets me is that they that there are still some people who think I'm gonna take this O3 and I'm gonna sporterize it. And then it'll make me a hunt rifle. It's like, dude, you could sell that rifle for a grand and buy a new rifle that shoots better with an optic and make money. Like I was could. at the range. I was at the range shooting a Vetterly 7087, and a, a guy came up and said, You ever thought put a put, putting a scope on that? And I was like why why would i ever do that yeah that's like the uh i don't know that's like the is that the old timer thing they just your eyes get so bad at a certain point that you just have to put a scope on everything you could could show up to a range with like a a musket and somebody go oh why don't you drill and tap that for a scope (laughs) and the thing that you're just lost the thing that gets me about that is so they do the there's a turkey shoot and an egg uh a ham shoot every year at the range and you shoot an egg at 90 yards offhand. And I've done it. I've got it. Like with, I've done it with a K31. I've done it with a P17. I've done it with an M1. Like I've done it, right? And if you do it with a rifle with a scope on it, you see this. This is what you see when you're shooting. Because you're, you're offhand with no support. And your crosshairs are going back and forth. But when you shoot with opens, you see this. It's dead solid. Because you, your eyes cannot understand the the slight adjustments that are happening, and I've had better luck shooting with open sights, because I don't see the mass, the little micro movements. Yeah, hmm. that opens have. It's a it's it's really fun. Try it sometime if you don't. And if you don't believe me, if anyone doesn't believe me, shoot offhand at hundred yards, because you focus the whole time on man. I'm I'm like. I'm all over the place. I gotta be left. I gotta be right. I gotta be left. I gotta be right. And you're you're back and forth. But with opens, I'm like, shit, I'm on that bitch. Boom. <laughs> and then especially the old guys that are there, because always old guys are like, How did you do that? I'm like, you just hold a rifle up and shoot it. Like <laughs> it's really fun. I don't know. I, I enjoy the hell out of it, but especially with an old Milsurp next time. <laughs> yeah, especially with an old Millsurp gun. It's the best. Like the P17, the the M17s, Eddie Stones, whatever you want to call them, they're the best. The, the flip up sights, you have the sight flipped up, and you're just, you know, and you touch. Oh, I love it! It's the best. <laughs> I have to say, probably my favorite experience would have to have been the guy that had like a full on like vice 
set up on one of the tables so that his gun was locked into place. It's a ransom rest. And and he was shooting some semi-automatic, but it was a twenty-two. But it had like this massive fucking optic on it, and I'm just like, the fuck, whatever. So I'm down, I don't know, three or four lanes down from him. There's no walls or anything. It's just tables, right? And I'm shooting at a hundred yards of the steel plate, and I'm pretty sure it was my either my M9130 or the Type 53. So it's surplus out of that spam can I got, and and you hit that steel plate, it sounds like a fucking hammer is hitting it, right? Because he's his like little twenty two is going ting, ting, and then when mine is bang, and then it did that. I did that three times. I'm not saying I'm a great shooter or whatever. I did it three times, and he starts packing his shit up to go. He's like, I'm I'm not dealing with this. <laughs> I'm just like. What is going on? <laughs> yeah, I know a lot of old timers that are into that. Yeah. Yeah. That are like into the, the like I don't mm-hmm. even I wouldn't even call it shooting. You're 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 sitting it on a vice and you're like getting it dialed in and then yeah. and then he's shooting it. And I'm just like, that's not shooting. You're pulling the yeah, you're just pulling the trigger. You get it set up and you pull the trigger. But then you get to say that this gun is super accurate. It can it can hit a dime, you know, all the rounds hit within a dime at a hundred. That's what he was doing. He wasn't. It wasn't like he was trying. I don't know. Maybe he was trying to sight it in. That maybe that's what he was trying to do. I don't know. But it was really weird. The whole that's, set. I've never seen another full setup like that again. That's the rifle can shoot that good. You can't. Mm. That, that reminds me of that. Have you seen that little video that that's making fun of that, where the guy's like going all in on measuring everything and being precise with the shot? Hmm. No, I don't. I don't think I've seen that. There, there's this one. It's like it's like a minute long video, and it's like he's doing everything. He's checking the wind speeds. He's measuring the temperature. He's doing all these calculations, dialing in a scope, um, and, and it's like this long. It just keeps going on and on and on. Every single little thing. He gets behind the rifle, pulls the trigger, and like hits like eight inches off to the left, and he gets up and he like throws it on the ground, and the, the target's like five feet in front of him. It's like I don't know. You gotta find the video of that. It's really yeah. funny. I mean, there's there is science to that, and there there are times where you should do that. Like if you are sighting in an optic, yeah, because you want the optic. Oh to yeah, on. yeah, yeah. But then your eye reads the optic differently. So you're off, like, if you hand your, your friend a rifle, he, he might see the optic differently than you do. So, like, you, you want to be on zero, but beyond that, it's you. The rifle's more accurate than you Minute are. of man. That's all you need. Yeah. So man. If you can hit something, you're good. Yeah. I don't, I just don't like scopes that much. I've never no. enjoyed shooting through a scope. That's what it is. Also, uh... I've also done the dumb thing where uh, you get the raccoon eye. Oh. You get a little too close to that uh, scope. Yeah. And it, uh, it tells oh, you yeah. close. <laughs> you get the, yeah, you get the scope like right there and you shoot. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. You always yeah. see. Mm-hmm. You always see that yeah, the person right. like has the rifle stock over their shoulder or something trying to. That always pisses me off because it's always a girl. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, man. And they're taking a video of it. And I'm like. You know, I realize that the girl's getting hit by whatever it is, but you're the asshole because you know better. And you oh, fuck her up for can't life. handle recoil like, videos or whatever. Like, yeah. It's, yeah, it's like it's super shitty because it's like it's really cool of her to go to the range with you. Yeah, yeah. and like and you unappreciatively put her through yeah. something instead of making a, it an enjoyable experience for a cheap laugh. Yeah. Put but, a slug shot in a uh, in a like a sawed off shotgun with a pistol grip. Yeah, just be like, haha, I try to handle this, bitch. You try to handle it. Yeah, it's like that like, shit ain't going. Like, you're not gonna teleport as soon as somebody touches that. Yeah, it's a ninety pound woman shooting a shotgun with high brass in it. What do you think's gonna happen? Yeah, like I can't and, tell you how many times I've seen videos of what the 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 pistols with or the shotguns with the pistol grips. And, yeah, and it just like. What do you expect is going to happen? Like, yeah. what, what do you think is going to happen? Fucking it, lowbrow FUD humor. Yeah. And the only time that I can honestly say where I did anything like that and it was not 
like that where I'm like videoing my wife was we put high brass we we shot low brass and I was like listen this is what we put in the shotgun when we go home and it was high brass buckshot I'm like I want you to shoot at least one round so you know this is what's coming if you need it and she's like okay and it thumped her and she's like that sucks I'm like okay so if you're gonna shoot it you gotta know what's coming because you're gonna need another round and like that was yeah. the end of it but you warned and her then, and she expected well, yeah. it I shot it first. Like I didn't. I didn't just throw high brass in it and walk away. Like I shot it first. Like, I wasn't ah, the only ah, one on the range. Yeah. Like we talked about it. You know, I I fully I gave her like the college explanation of what was going to happen, and she shot one round. And she was like, "Okay, thank you." But I've had on the other side of the coin, I've had people that are like, "I won't touch a shotgun." I had a guy who put high. Like he did something, and it really hurt me. I'm like, he ruined your entire shooting thing because he wanted to laugh at you fuck that dude that's bullshit yeah yeah, yeah fuck, I, fuck those guys I yeah i don't like i don't like 45 pistols because the first time i've ever shot one was a like a, a small concealed carry kimber that's literally like like the size of my hand yeah it's like it's like this big and it's a 45 yeah i, I, I fucking get split. it wow ah! i'm like no yeah. no 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 I don't like shooting 44 mag, not because I can't shoot a 44 mag, but because it recoils goofy for me in my hands. I I don't know if it was just I think it was just the Smith that I was shooting, but I've shot like 454 and that's fine. But 44 mag in a Smith to me hurts. So I don't shoot hmm. it. But I that's and I know how to shoot it. Like Milsert Mike let me shoot his 44 mag, and I thought that thing kicked a lot. He was going to let me shoot his, his 500. He has a 500 Smith. And I was like, let's start with the 44 first. And I shot it, and I was like, that's it. I don't need any more. Comically, seen... I think what it was is it was a Super Red Hawk or a Smith. It might have been a Smith, but it was double action where the single actions, because I have a 41 Ruger, the single actions that don't have the extra... Uh, spur for the that just comes with a single a double action frame, like an actual cowboy gun shoots real good for me because they kind of flip up, so you can come up and they flip up at the same time. So hmm. try a single action only. Hmm. A couple months ago, a friend of mine at the range, uh, he was shooting a 500 Magnum. He was shooting some reloads for, and uh, I've never shot anything handgun wise beyond like a. 38 special 45 like nothing crazy and, and he was shooting his 500 magnum and he says you want to shoot it and i'm like i've never shot 357 44 anything like I've, I've never shot anything more than like a 45 so he hands it to me and puts one round in there and i i want a 500 magnum <laughs> they're a lot of fun the the best training tool that i've had is for at least a new shooter, and I use my wife as an example, she's not here, she's sleeping, which is, it's a six-shot revolver but five rounds in it. Because she was shooting, like, here, 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 and then she would get mad, and then it would click, and she's like, Ksh! I'm like, see? That is the problem. Put five rounds in it and see what she does. It was It was the best, because then... She started doing it on her own. She put five rounds in it. And then the third time she she went through, like it was like the second shot, and she was click and she was dead on it. And then from there she was drilling holes with it. Hmm. Oh yeah, the old the, the old flinch. Yeah, somebody yeah. that that reminds me, somebody just commented, Aaron, on the video of uh Sam shooting the M ninety five and said something about him flinching. The one with me and Sam? Yeah, yeah. Let's see. Yeah. That flinch, though. LMAO. Yeah. The uh, Swiss K31 versus Styrum 95 video. Oh, uh, whatever. From a, from a Robert. I'm not going to say his last name. Uh, I was going to say we were talking about... Uh, ridiculous stuff we've seen shot. I not I haven't shot it myself, but I've seen somebody shoot this. 
There was somebody at the range one time that had a fifty ninety sharps, the black yeah. powder, and he shot it. <laughs> I was like, "Well, I've never seen a bowling ball go down range before, but <laughs> today is a new day." <laughs> yeah. Black powder is a. There was a there was a sharps a Petersoli sharps at the gun show today in forty five one twenty. Oh, with cool! A, with, a, with an octagonal oh, bull barrel. Wrong. Yeah. That Petersoli sharps weighed probably twenty something pounds. Yeah, I really cool. struggled to shoulder it. It's a quickly done under barrel. That's yeah. awesome. That's that shit's. I like that stuff. I don't know. I, Muzzle loading is fun. I, I I have a Petersoli Bounty 50 caliber pistol. It, it's like a 16 inch barreled percussion pistol in 50 cal, and I load that thing with like 50, 60 grains of, of 3F. It's it's a beast. I love it. That's why I like the Martini and the and the Snyder. Like I I've yeah. never handed someone like because we went we did this uh it was our unit but we did like a machine gun shoot. And I showed up, and the first thing I shot was the Snyder, black powder. Like, everyone's like, what do we shoot first? I'm like, here. And I gave, I gave someone the Snyder, and they're like, it's like, it is fun. It's just fun. I've never handed anyone the rifle that didn't just shoot it once and turn around laughing. And it's 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 a 5.77 on, like, 85 grains of black, and it's just this, and it pushes you. It doesn't, it doesn't hit you. It pushes you back that's it's, that's it's, what uh the guy that shot the the 5090 said it wasn't it's not like a it's not a like a punch like smokeless is it's a shove it's a shove yes and it's and it's and it's it's just like a big guy walked up and goes boom just like yep. that that's exactly and how i would describe it's it. not it's not a punch it's just get out of my way yes <laughs> yeah and i took it down to, to west virginia for a buddy of mine and we were shooting it like a fridge and something else just because he was he had some shit to shoot at it didn't matter and he put like a pan or a pot on top of his fridge and he's like can you shoot that i'm like yeah and i throw around in it and i shouldered it and i shot and i blew the finger off of it and it puts a hole in it that's that big and he's like that is so cool like he wanted to shoot it and then it was you need to come down here and hunt deer with this thing we need to shoot a deer with this thing <laughs> it's just it's just fun Anyway, it's it's midnight yeah. here. It's one. It's officially midnight, so it's a good it's time to a uh, good time to call it quits, I guess, for for tonight. Um, geez, I just realized I've been I've been playing with this the whole time. I don't know. Hopefully, it hasn't been super uh, loud. Uh, no, no, we just see your hands moving down. Oh, down, right. just down here. Just I was right definitely, right. definitely playing with this. Just, just yeah, handling your gun. That's right. Handling yeah. my my gun. Yes. Now that one doesn't shoot blanks, does it? Clearly not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know. Only one uh, person... We had, a, we had a terrible joke series last time, so I figured we had a terrible joke uh, right there. Oh, so. uh, yeah. Yeah, we got to. Only one person's commented on the short about, about kid number two coming, so I was, uh, so I was ex kind of expecting more people to catch that, but... Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so thanks so much, Cody, for coming on and educating us about the uh, about the Vetterlies and the um, and the explodiness of them. Um, Thank you. Yes, yeah, I'm gonna keep shooting them. Yeah, yeah. So if anybody runs across Cody, make sure you send him the link to uh, CN Arsenal's video to let him mm -hmm. know about the. I, every time he posts on Reddit, I'll, I'll do it. I'll send it a link. <laughs> Just make sure. Yeah, make the next it the next time. The next time, organize Othias to get on here with me, and then we can have like a, a hash it out. <laughs> yeah, that that'd be a fun one. Yeah, just or or just ask him like maybe who loaded for him or whatever. Because I I I wonder if maybe somebody else loaded, you know, reloaded it uh, the the six five for him, and they would know like the loadings or whatever. It's, it's a friend uh, of they theirs. Have a, they have a guy. Yeah, that it's, does it's that. a friend yeah. of theirs. That's what I mean. Doesn't... Like you'd have to probably find out like the the loadings yeah. and stuff to to answer that, but yeah, it's all all interesting. And then like slug the bore and know what the what the bore what what were the bores of those guns that blew up? You know, you even still have them. Yeah. You just throw. I wonder what happened to them. You just throw them away or something. What do you do with what do I, you do? With I'm them? hoping they're on the wall. They're just on a different part of it. They're just like in pieces. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, frame shards. all the shards. Yeah, yeah the next to that. Well, Are you kidding me? That yeah. would be in a shadow box. I put it up somewhere. I'm like, especially if like yeah. if I was behind the gun and I survived, I would put that shit up in a shadow box. Are you? It's kidding like keeping me? your plastic off a motorcycle, man. Trust me. Yeah. So uh, yeah, thanks for everyone for watching. This is a late night one for us, so yeah. uh, forgive our it's, fatigue. But it's uh, Millsurf World nights. Yeah, yeah. After after hours. After hours. Yeah. Now we're gonna switch over to OnlyFans since it's since it's past midnight. <laughs> okay. Thank you, thank you, everyone for listening. We'll. Uh, Cheers. Okay. What are Frost. you doing? Got my fan. Oh. Okay. Okay, I see. Thank you for that one. Yeah. (laughs) Are you still recording? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay.